Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Turnips Digest. Um, I it, There's not much to really uh, preface this with, except that I'm joined today by the one and only Paul Fahrenheit. How are you doing, sir? You know, I'm just outstanding. Uh, I love how I love how anyone can call me if, if they need someone who isn't particularly smart but is good at talking. <laughs> That's uh, I don't think that I would characterize you as uh, filling that role today, just because uh, this... The thing that we're going to cover today, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, requires someone that can uh, um, view this work from multiple different levels, because I could have certainly gotten any other guests on to get a uh, very canned response, uh, what's probably going to be the prevailing uh, takeaway in the chat, um, but um, I, I think it's safe to say that I'm, I'm quite happy with you being on here, Paul, just because you are... Uh, um, quite a firebrand uh, when you need to be, and uh, you typically surprise me with the perspectives you take. So, I, I, I don't discount that. yourself. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and and you know, to to you know, kind of spoil the piece a little bit before we get into it. I'm gonna I'm just, I'm gonna say this to kind of care. I never thought I would ever feel as much sympathy for the New York Jewish community as I did reading this piece. <laughs> and that's uh that's saying something i'd I'd imagine oh yeah no no yeah and, and we'll get into it we'll you know the listeners you know if the listeners are kind of raising eyebrows at that you know once we get into this piece you'll kind of understand what i mean by that um this is like this is a pretty you know this is a pretty um interesting ground level look into what it was really like in a lot of the immigrant ghettos in you know early mid cent not early early 20th early to mid 20th century america even later 20th century america um and i'm sure it was a lot worse uh in previous times before this essay was written but it's it's interesting you know you 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 really do get to see like the amount of suffering that these uh that these immigrant communities really did go through when they came here and you know you can even argue that that kind of suffering is an argument for maybe they shouldn't have even come here in the first place Right, and I, we're going to get into this just because there is uh, probably a thousand and one ways you can take this essay, and I know we're at least going to touch on about five or so. You just mentioned one, but uh, uh, just to preface uh, this for anyone that's watching, uh, this is going to be very weird in some places. Uh, uh, we, we are, of course, talking about uh, Norman Podhoritz's uh, famous essay, uh, My Negro Problem and Ours, um, which was published in the 1960s when he was the editor of uh, Commentary Magazine, if I remember correctly. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, race relations, basically, and especially Brooklyn in his childhood, and then applying that to the 60s. Um, he's going to get pretty weird. Uh, uh, not quite at Rod Dreher levels of weird when talking about other races, but he, he gets basically close for the time. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I mean the, the, this, this group of people is known for being weird in long form, um, I don't want to say narcissistic, but I mean... I, I don't I don't know if I'd call anything autobiographical narcissistic, but you know this group of people is known for being weird in their uh, <laughs> in their autobiographical works. Right. This is uh so specifically uh, Norman Podhoritz uh, grew up in Brooklyn uh, in particular, um, and he's going to be talking about sort of the sociology of these different uh, groups, particularly Jews, Italians, and Blacks, um, and he's going to be talking uh, very strangely perhaps uncomfortably about like black masculinity and all this other stuff for a good maybe sixth of this piece um and then other other parts we'll, we're going to get into it a little bit more just because the the other parts are aren't weird they're just uh, political um so for everyone wondering how this series is being conducted if you didn't uh, catch it on any of the other streams or if this is your first time tuning in or if you need a reminder um we are picking up essays from a book called the essential neoconservative reader um, and, and this book is quite uh, quite a good uh, map for us to go through, just because the neoconservatives are one of the few movements that did not really publish an, a, a manifesto that they all agreed on, or a, a, a list of points or whatever. They just kind of uh, were labeled neoconservatives originally by uh, Matthew Harrington, the uh, Democratic Socialist of America founder, the, the famous uh, socialist uh, ex-Catholic. Um, they, they were just labeled as neoconservatives and kind of rolled with it. You know, um, uh, these, these kind of yeah. essay collections used to be pretty ubiquitous back before the 24-hour news cycle when American politics was at baseline a lot more long form and literate. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the, you know, how we're, the West is becoming less and less literate. And this is sort of the millennials and early Zoomers are kind of the last literate generation. Um, and, you know, but 
kind of something on this. When I was in college, I found one of these Buckleyite essay collections. This was not the neocom. It was like, you know, it was like a cross section of conservative essays, whatever. And I open it up, and one of the first things I see is a Revelo P. Oliver essay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know that was that was that was pretty interesting. But yeah, anyway. yeah, it is a uh, it is certainly from a different time where articles from uh, from like edited magazines, uh, intellectually curated magazines, were driving political opinion. Uh, certainly, certainly, I don't think is the case anymore. Uh, definitely not in the same degree. If you're going to argue that it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and the, once again, the reason we're doing this is because this is not necessarily a unified movement. You can't really point to, like, the neoconservative position on anything, but if you can find one of their major figures saying something, you can be certain that a large section of their, uh, of their base, who, whoever the neoconservatives are in the population, support it. Um, I, I caught flack for this earlier this week when I called a, a, a Matt Walsh tirade basically neoconservative uh, when he was uh, making fun of, once again, uh, women that don't like working in the workforce. Um, and instead of uh, just asking why are they in the workforce or anything like that, his main, the main thrust of his argument was that, uh, well, working is hard and you're going to be working no matter what. Um, you know, if you run to be a mother, it's going to be even more work. And I uh, said this sounds very neoconservative. People didn't quite get that because uh, a lot of people think that neocons, neoconservatives, are just foreign policy hawks. Um, and hopefully, this series kind of shows that there's a little bit more depth than just uh, invading countries. Yeah, there is. There is a little bit more depth, and just because now, just because a political position has depth and nuance, doesn't mean it's a correct position that you should subscribe to. Of course, but at, this, yeah. but at the same time, I mean, you know, could you characterize Mr. Turnipsey to delay our going into this essay even further? Uh, could you characterize, you know, the neo the neo conservative position generally as being in favor of the mid century sort of military industrial permanent mobilization uh, wartime footing? Uh, for the rest of time, is it, do you think that you could characterize that as a sort of way of support of, of the neo composition, not just the, not just essentially infinite defense budget spending, which I have, trust me, I've gone on tirades about uh, the way that the United States conducts its defense policy with how we um, man and equip our military, but uh, also things like you know, you know, mobilizing both genders in the workforce uh, in order to have as much production as possible. Um, I, 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 can't, I yeah. can't think of other things, but go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, so this is a... I, I don't know that I would say that they're in favor of permanent mobilization, or at least I don't think they would explicitly say that. <clears throat> but certainly a lot of their positions uh, seem to align towards this, at least societally. This is why when we were discussing... Uh, when uh, Raging Mandel and I were discussing uh, Irving Kristol, the, the godfather of neoconservatism, as he's been labeled everywhere, when we were discussing his position on uh, welfare last week, uh, this is part of the arguments that he made for unlimited social security for the elderly and then having the youth bear the full consequences of their actions, uh, where he quite grossly said, should mothers decide to keep their children? Uh, I, you know, that's still kind of ringing in my ears, but um, th this is part of it. Part of the, part of the uh, reason he says that the elderly should just become fully, benef fully benefited by the uh, welfare system is because they are patriotic. They fought the wars. This is what the system needs to align to, and it should be that way. Um, when we were discussing foreign policy, um, they take a much more nuanced approach, I think, than perhaps their implementation might give off. Um, but they aren't, uh, they aren't peaceful in any sense of the word. Uh, but ha having said that, there's a good uh, case to be made for quite a lot of these people that they aren't actually really interested in warfare. They're just taking the, uh, taking the expert opinion, uh, which is where, where today's essay and a few of the other ones that we've discussed so far come in. Um, when we uh, start talking about race relations, there's nothing necessarily uh, indicative of a uh, foreign policy or mobilization there. It's w this is where, in particular, their former liberalism from the, uh, from the FDR years starts to come into play, and they're wondering why it isn't around anymore. Why is it continuing to move? Um, so that's what I would say, but uh, Mr. Fahrenheit, if you have a different opinion, by all means put it forward, uh, just because I'm, I'm not arbiting what neoconservatism is here i'm just telling people what they wrote well i don't i mean i don't like the neocons as much as anyone else i mean you know uh i'm a you know if you could describe my political position it would you know be like a sort of kissinger type 
uh, ultra pragmatic realist on the foreign policy stage, war when war makes sense, peace when peace makes sense, uh, empire where empire makes sense, um, autarky when autarky makes sense. You know, that's it's 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 kind of like it's like I, I in terms of in terms of that, it's like I don't really try to come into it with ideology. I will I will say this. I think the the neoconservatives are, you know, one of the one of these sort of like last vestiges of this century of ideology that, you know, really most all ideologies are just poor replacement for Christianity or or other societally organizing principles. Um, they're based on like extremely abstracted concepts, which are very difficult for people to grasp if they haven't had a entire upbringing inculcated in a certain literary tradition, uh, if they haven't been shaped by certain societal institutions in order to be receptive to the ideas which ideologies uh, you know, portray. Um, and, and in all honesty, I think the neocons are just kind of some of, you know, they're, they're a good example, you know, them and like the, you know, I guess they're, they're eternal other side of the coin, the neolibs, they're both kind of indicative of these, of these last fumes of this sort of century of ideology. And, you know, I think by mid century of the 21st century, which Lord willing, I'll still be alive for, I think, um, political arguments will, much more resemble something like, you know, like a, like a, like a, like a state Congress meeting of, you know, farmers are, are begging the state for money and manufacturers are begging the state for money. And, and, you know, and politicians are also begging the state for money. That's where, that's where I think it's going. We're seeing a breakdown of any sort of complicated politics just simply because I don't think, I don't think the conditions for complicated politics like there were in the 20th century are just are there anymore. And so it's going to look a lot more like, you know, big man, uh, give me, give me stuff politics uh, as a, as a rule. Uh, uh, right. We're, we're speculating here. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that, that makes perfect sense just because, uh, especially looking back at a lot of, uh, a lot of what ideology in the 20th century specifically drove, it seems, uh, very, uh, uh, luxurious. Um, oh, yeah. some, sometimes, uh, sometimes too much. So, um, it seems it seems like we don't have the material or the or the uh, the wealth stored up anymore to actually go on these ideological crusades or structure our societies around ideology. It seems like we have uh, very much spent uh, what wealth we had, and now we're kind of regressing back towards something a bit more basic and real. Well, you know, and I think, and uh, this will be the last thing I say, and I think this will actually be a good segue into the article, but. You know, you could talk about the resources. Yes, you could talk about the availability of certain industries popping up in the mid 20th century and and this these massively growing populations with the massive availability of foodstuffs, uh, the likes of which has not yet will probably never again be seen, at least for another couple thousand years, assuming the second coming doesn't happen in human history. Um, but I mean, the thing of it, of it is, too, is I think, you know, all I take the mindset that all problems are human problems. All problems are people problems. All issues are human capital issues. Uh, resource issues are actually relatively minor. Um, if you, what is, what is it? Um, if you, if you have sufficient human capital, I think you can usually solve most issues. Um, and about the mid 20th century, I mean, if you, if you take a track of the, I, the average IQ of your given American citizen, uh, it, it's about a 10 point increase not a 10 point. I, th I don't know if it's a 10 point increase, but it's a significant increase. It's a couple of points increase every decade of the 19th century until you get to about 1910 where it peaks. I think the average IQ of, 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 a, of an American was like 105 or something in like 1910. I could be wrong, uh, but I remember seeing this somewhere. And around that era, you have like, you know, people wonder why we've, you know, some of, some of us on the right have started you know, extolling the virtues of someone like William McKinley or uh, Roosevelt or Taft or Wilson or, you know, Harding or Coolidge, like like this kind of chain of presidents right here. These are the basically everyone from, you know, from um, McKinley to Hoover, in all honesty. Um, Hoover is a very unsung president, um, probably one of the best of the 20th century in terms of like guarding American interests, but you know, he gets overshadowed, but pretty much any, and, and even FDR personally, to a certain extent was a product of this, but like that string of presidents was like the peak of human capital. You know, we talk about literacy here. They benefited from a century of increasing literacy of increasing, um, awareness. Like these people were coming out of high school, 
uh, like not just the presidents, but this generation was coming out of high school speaking Latin and Greek, uh, yeah, maybe right. a couple, yeah. maybe a couple of the modern languages. Uh, they, they were supposed to draw maps from memory and all this it, other stuff. Exactly. That's and that's absolutely ludicrous in terms of like you know today I I I speak English and that's it. You know, I speak a little bit of Spanish and I speak a little bit of German, but you know, but other than that, I, I can't, I can't, and I can draw some maps from memory, but it's like, it's like not to the level of rigor and discipline that the average, you know, upper level high school student was expected at that time. And that didn't go away. Yeah, it started going the other way after about 1910, it started decreasing a couple of points, but you know, about mid century is when all that human capital kind of exhausted itself in the world wars. Um, and it's been a steady, gradual decline since. And the key to that is the literacy, the, you know, the, the schooling that was back when like the Ivy leagues were actually like what we imagined them to be, what high schools, what, what we imagined them to be. These people were educated, literate, had read hundreds, if not thousands of books by the time they reached adulthood. And they were extremely well in tuned with what, you know, Western culture was, what American, what America was. And that's also how you're able to insert a lot of very bad ideas, a lot of, you know, unfounded ideas where you can kind of twist principles if you know how to do it properly and sort of hack the coding they were given. Right. And I, I think that we're about to talk about this in particular, just because, uh, uh, as, as might have been mentioned uh, beforehand, the author of our essay today is going to start out by appealing to a... Uh, a civil rights activist, and we'll we'll flash a picture up on the screen just because the the editors of this uh, of this essay collection have a little excerpt from him before the uh, actual essay starts. Um, but Pod Horitz himself was a uh, by by all accounts a very intelligent uh, uh, journalist, uh, which I know a pretty pretty terrible profession either way. Um, but very intelligent. Um, however, uh, you you can very easily start to see where these. Uh, bad ideas start creeping into people and uh perhaps uh perhaps it's their intelligence or their understanding of their intelligence that allows them to think that it can only be a good idea yeah um but 17 minutes in let's go <laughs> <laughs> so uh i will uh i'll uh switch over to uh show you this uh james baldwin character who's going to be quoted right before we start because he's also going to be referenced uh pretty heftily in the uh, in the uh, uh, text here, so um, here we go. Uh, there's your there's your James Baldwin, um, and this excerpt right before the essay reads: "If we, and I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others, do not falter in our duty now, we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country." And change the history of the world. So that's uh, that's the start of this neoconservative volume. Is uh, with that quote from this guy, um, and he's going to be referenced pretty frequently uh, by Pod Horitz as we go through this uh, as we go through this essay. So um, this is who Pod Horitz is uh, quoting from. He, he looks he looks like a Star Wars alien. <laughs> I, like, yeah, like, like he doesn't even look like a black person. He looks like a Star Wars alien. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, yeah. sorry. I hope we don't get striked no. for that. No, I mean, I if we're going to get striked, it's because it's going to be because of uh, probably the title of this essay. So this is a uh, uh, Norman Podhoritz's "My Negro Problem and Ours," um, and the way that this is structured for the audience is I'm going to keep reading until Paul or I have something to add in, and then that's where the uh, conversation is going to take place. So I'll I'll just start here. Paul knows to interrupt at any point in time. Uh, Podhoritz starts. Two ideas puzzled me deeply as a child growing up in Brooklyn during the 1930s and what today would be called an integrated neighborhood. One of them was that all Jews were rich. The other was that all Negroes were persecuted. These ideas had appeared in print, therefore they must be true. My own experience and the evidence of my senses told me they were not true, but that, but that only confirmed what a daydreaming boy in the provinces for the lower class neighborhoods of New York belong as surely to the provinces as any rural town in North Dakota. Okay, stop. <laughs> yeah, that that when I when I read that line, I just kind that was that's kind of like a what is it? I don't want to like read too much into that, but I'm going to kind of throw my hands up and just say no. Um I read <laughs> that. No. No. No, that's not at all true. Um I I completely disagree with that. 
anyway, keep yeah, going. Yeah, well, no, no, elaborate. Why, why is this important? Well, look, proximity to urban centers of any kind means that you are in the core. It doesn't matter if you're in the poor neighborhoods of New York. If you have proximity to urban centers, then you are influencing the culture at a much greater rate than, let's just say, the frickin' pro the rural town in North Dakota. No, that's a totally false equivalence. I completely disagree right. with that. Yeah, and uh, that's that's exactly how I put it. Especially since he's he has this uh, aside here, and he's going to uh, um, he's going to go on and say like he remembers seeing uh, uh, Mayor Lagardia and all these well, other I'm a, famous I'm a people. American, just like the rest of you. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'll, I'll continue on here just because the yeah i saw this too and it was very egregious especially for the first paragraph <clears throat> he continues um for the lower class neighborhoods of new york belong as surely to the provinces as any rural town in north dakota discovers very early his experience is unreal and the evidence of his senses is not to be trusted yet even a boy with a head full of fantasies incongruously uh, synthesized out of Hollywood movies and the English novels, cannot altogether deny the reality of his own experience, especially when there is so much deprivation in that experience. Nor can he altogether gainsay the evidence of his own sen uh, senses, especially such evidence of the senses as comes from being repeatedly beaten up, robbed, and in general hated, terrorized, and humiliated. So I don't want to talk... I'm, I, I... We, this is a somewhat long essay, and we're going to try to get through it. I don't want to talk too much about this, but yeah, yeah. basically this sentiment he's expressing here in the second half of the paragraph is kind of the story of the 20th century right here. And really, it's the story of, of you know, there's been a lot of talk, you know, Marshall McLuhan, um, is, it, is it David Innes? Is that his name? I remember his last name um, and and other media thing. Mencken, Mencken kind of talks about this a little bit, too, um, you know, the 20th century is this, you know, at the beginning of the century, you essentially, other than newspapers and telegraphs, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you have communication methods that are 90% unchanged since the Middle Ages. All right. right by, the, yeah. by, by the end of the 20th century, you have, uh, you know, the World Wide Web and personal communication uh, devices that can contact literally anyone at any time in real time. Uh, and, you know, social media, I, you know, I, I think social media, the invention of social media really was kind of the, 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 the penultimate um, uh, media innovation. Uh, people talking about AI and GPT, I, I really, I think that's a nothing burger. I think, you know, it's this, it's, it's a silver bullet and people want it to be a silver bullet. I'm, you know, I don't, I, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Um, I also think it's already existed for several years. Um, but the point is, you know, he says this line here, yet even a boy with a head full of fantasies incongruously synthesized out of Hollywood movies and English novels cannot altogether deny the reality of his own experience. All right. So look, this is this this thing right here. This is the 20th century. All right. Mass media as a thing. And I think we've started learning that we can separate out the generations. Boomer, you know, if you want to read about the generations, I wrote a whole article on it on my sub stack, Swan Song of the Lost Generations. Um if you want to go read that, but I think we've learned that we can actually separate the generations out pretty easily based upon the media innovations that happened in their childhood. The greatest generation, um, or well, you know, not the greatest generation. Well, well, yeah, the greatest generation is, um, you, I guess you could say, um, the lost generation is radio. The lost generation right, is yeah. radio. Uh, the greatest generation is like the moving pictures you know, is, is the movies. All right. That's, that's, that separated them from the lost. All right. Uh, the silence is TVs. All right. The boomers is I think color TVs. Gen X is 24 hour television. The idea of a, of, of constant media on demand. Like it's not like, it's not, you know, at the level of, you know, let's say VHS tapes or DVDs yet, but for the Gen Xers, they were bombarded by TV became a sort of, you know, MTV was a 24 hour thing The 24 hour channels started about the time that Gen X was coming of age. And so media was no longer this set scheduled thing that all of the TV stations were off after a certain time. Um, no, for Gen X, that's the 24 hour media for millennials. It's uh, computers and the early internet. Uh, dial up stuff like that and for gen z it's high speed internet and smartphones and you know social media and the like so that's and you know 
those are sort of hard and fast distinctions. All right. But this is why the 20th century is so difficult for us to wrap our mind about. It's why people can believe, can be mass basically convinced of these falsehoods, you know, such as uh, certain events that went on in Central Europe in the mid-century um, involving um, involving typhus and the like. Um, you know, a bunch of people can be convinced of that simply because the market was totally wide open and, you know, you could bring anything to it. You know, he's talking right here of how the things he was told in Hollywood movies and in English novels were at complete odds with his on the ground experience. And that was just about everyone. All right. And, and the thing is, the thing is, is the power of mass media uh, is that, you know, in Western society, people would side with the mass media because it was this impersonal thing that like, you know, they could put in the place of the word of God. They would choose that over their own experience. Right. And not only is mass media this impersonal uh, and incorporeal being, <clears throat> basically, uh, but it's also been specifically crafted to portray like a perfect archetype of something. If they want to fabricate something or make a narrative or uh, uh, basically make something exist in reality, uh, a, a, a idea that isn't actually real. <clears throat> or at least doesn't reflect itself from reality. Um, they can make it perfect, basically. <clears throat> this yeah. is why uh, this is why all the narratives that come out of Hollywood are so hard to shake from the average person, just because it's uh, uh, it takes all the boxes that you'd expect from something real. It's why you are rediscovering in a lot of fiction that you have to put something basically insane in there, just because insanity is what real reality is, not these uh, not these perfect archetypes and perfect narratives that come out of uh, the new mass media. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, and I, once again, I don't want to get on this too much, but this is, this is something I really did want to emphasize. Um, what was I, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Shoot. What was I going to say? Um, <laughs> well, okay. We can, we can go ahead. I may. Yeah. Remember. Yeah. If, if it comes back to you, just say it. But, uh, but yeah, this is, this is something with the neoconservatives. This has been, as has been pointed out in a few streams is that they will oftentimes uh, start or throw in the middle something that's very true, uh, something that is almost undeniable. Um, it's just that they will then, uh, whether because they want to cling to uh, their earlier liberal priors or because they want to, um, or, or because they don't realize they still have them and think that it's uh, they're conservatives now or whatever else, uh, they, they take these great facts and uh, just kind of abuse them to fit a, fit a false narrative, if you will. That, that's how yeah. I've been understanding this but so if that comes back to you just say but i will uh i'll continue on in the next paragraph um pot Horitz continues and so for a long time i puzzled to think that jews were supposed to be rich when the only jews i knew were poor and that negroes were supposed to be persecuted when it was the negroes who were doing the only persecuting i knew about and doing it moreover to me during the early years of the war when my older sister joined a left-wing youth organization I remembered my astonishment at hearing her passionately denounce my father for thinking that Jews were worse off than Negroes. To me, at the age of 12, it seemed very clear that Negroes were better off than Jews, indeed, than all whites. A city boy's world is contained within three or four square blocks, and quick. in my... Okay. Yeah. Just one, one, one little thing, indeed, than all whites. Uh, it's, it's interesting, in this, in this instance, Jews are counting themselves as whites. And to be honest, I think, I think they... I think they kind of do, you know, I think they count themselves as white, but also as like this separate thing too. like, like they can play both sides and it's no cognitive dissonance to them. Well, yeah, because they, uh, uh, they, they have a category Jewish, which can or cannot be white depending on the, uh, depending on the moment, basically, yeah. or depending on the subject. Yep. Um, but this is, a. uh, uh yeah, this is uh, very interesting, just because, especially with a lot of these neoconservatives, depending on the direction that the civil rights movement is going, um, and we can definitely talk about this at later streams with uh, later works, uh, suddenly they're going to stop counting themselves as the whites, because you're going to see a lot of these uh, narratives that he's trying to counter here suddenly become accepted fact, and then the later neoconservatives are just going to take that as fact and are going to try to distance themselves from the group of people that includes these evil southern segregationists and whomever else. Yeah, but what's, you know, irony of ironies is, is that unfortunately, uh, the colored world sees, sees them as white. <laughs> right. And he's, he's going to talk about that as well. This is a, uh, he's going to make that point. Um, All right, let's keep going. So 
Uh, I'll, I'll just start at that uh, next sentence. A, city's bo a city boy's world is contained within three or four square, square blocks. And in my world, it was the whites, the Italians and Jews, who feared the Negroes, not the other way around. The Negroes were tougher than we were, more ruthless, and on the whole, they were better athletes. What could it mean, then, to say that they were badly off and that we were more fortunate? Yet my sister's opinions, like print, were sacred, and when she told me about exploitation and economic forces, I believed her. I believed her, but I was still afraid of Negroes, and I still hated them with all my heart. So this is, a, uh, um, this is where the essay is going to start turning into, like, the weird, uh, you know, just a few steps before Rod Dreher talking about his, uh, his classmates kind of a, kind of a weird, um, <laughs> You can you could read a lot into this. I'm not going to explicitly do it. If you buy into certain psychological uh, uh, frameworks, uh, he's uh, <laughs> he's being told by his sister that they are uh, this uh, oppressed class, and that gives them some sort of merit. Uh, he's being told that they are he's being told, and he's saying that they are perhaps physically more fit uh, than the Jewish population is. Uh, you guys can read into that what you will. <clears throat> it's just going to make this uh, a little bit more uncomfortable than if he just. Uh, was talking about the, uh, the ideas here, <laughs> but uh, he continues. It had not always been so, that much I can recall from early childhood. When did it start, this fear and this hatred? There was a kindergarten in the local public school, and given the character of the neighborhood, at least half of the children in my class must have been Negroes. Yet I have no memory of being aware of color differences at that age, and I know from observing my own children that they attribute no significance to such differences even when they begin noticing them. I think there was a day, first grade, second grade, when my best friend Carl hit me on the way home from school and announced that he wouldn't play with me anymore because I had killed Jesus. When I ran home to my mother crying for an explanation, she told me not to pay any attention to such foolishness, and then in Yiddish she cursed the Goyim and the Schwarzes and the Schwarzes and the Goyim. Carl, it turned out, was a Schwarze, and so was added a third time, or so, sorry, and so was added a third to the categories into which people were mysteriously divided. I'm not going to touch any of that. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, we're just going to let that stand, I think. So he continues, sometimes I wonder whether this is a true memory at all. It is blazingly vivid, but perhaps it never happened. Can anyone really remember back to the age of six? Um, I, I would say yes, personally. Uh, this is a I, I think this might just be an issue that, uh, especially a lot of these elites that have to uh, conform their thoughts to unreality uh, might deal with. But I don't know, Paul. Do do you remember back to the age of six? I remember before the age of six, although yeah. I don't. It's it's like uh, it's like you know, kind of like flashes of like single moments. I don't remember like a continuity. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I think this might be a, uh, um upper elite problem, if we wanted to phrase it that way. Um, but he continues. Or it, There's could no... be, it could just be a rhetorical thing he put in there. And <clears> yeah, sure. And we're reading too much into it. it may, maybe so, but um, you know, then why would, the, why would the rhetoric be in there? He's, he's obviously trying to poke at something. No. Um, so he no. says, There is no uncertainty in my mind, however, about the years that followed. Carl and I hardly ever spoke though we met in school every day up through the 8th and ninth or ninth grade. There would be embarrassed moments of catching his eye, or of his catching mine, for whatever it was that had attracted us to one another as very small children remained alive in spite of the fantastic barrier of hostility that had grown up between us, suddenly and out of nowhere. Nevertheless, friendship would have been impossible, and even if it had been possible, it would have been unthinkable. About that, there was nothing anyone could do by the time we were eight years old, <laughs> so uh, yeah, you can you can do the same reading into this as you uh, as you could do with his uh, discussion with his sister earlier. But uh, we'll we'll continue. We won't make that so explicit. Why, I, I got a question. He does this throughout the essay. Why does he just start paragraphs with in italics item colon? Um, I don't know if it's an editorial decision or if he's just trying to show uh, all these different times in which uh, uh, which would build up his hatred and his fear for this population. Uh, one, one of those two. Because I, these are all anecdotes. Everything before and everything after an item, um, and they're all going to play into answering his question: um, why the why the hatred and why the uh, um, all these other things. So 
I, I think it's an editorial decision, but perhaps someone more intelligent than I could tell us uh, why why these things are before an italicized item, these anecdotes from his youth. But um, really, they, they kind of just read right into the essay, so um, it's not the worst thing. Uh, ready to continue? Yep. Alrighty. So he says, The orphanage across the street is torn down. A city housing project begins to rise in its place. And on the marvelous vacant lot next to the old orphanage, they are building a playground. Much excitement and anticipation as opening days draw near. Mayor Lagardia himself comes to dedicate this great gesture of public benevolence. Uh, remember, this guy thinks he's in the provinces. <laughs> he speaks of neighborliness and, borrowing and borrowing cups of sugar. And of the playground, he says that children of all races, colors, and creeds will learn to live together in harmony. A week later... Some of us are swatting flies on the playground's inadequate little ball field. A gang of Negro kids, pretty much our own age, enter from the other side and order us out of the park. We refuse, proudly and indignantly, with superb masculine fervor. There is a fight. They win, and we retreat, half whimpering, half with bravado. My first nauseating experience of cowardice, and my first appalled realization that there are people in the world who do not seem to be afraid of anything, who act as though they have nothing to lose. Thereafter, the playground becomes a battleground, sometimes quiet, sometimes the scene of athletic competition between them and us. But rocks are thrown as often as baseballs. Gradually, we abandon the place and use the streets instead. The streets are safer, though we do not admit this to ourselves. We are not, after all, sissies. That most dreaded epithet of an American boyhood. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of this, like, you know, a lot of the, the stuff you can draw out of this would be pretty obvious to anyone. I'm not going to I'm not <laughs> going to comment on his uh, like you said, this is it is a little bit weird. It's like, hey, man, I mean, I, I, I get it. I get it that you're 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 basically telling us your your whole life story. And I mean, you know, the, 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 Jews are like this. All right. You know, they are they will all was everything is like a personal thing to them. You know, they, they, they're, they're a kind of people who remembers a lot. Um, you know, more often they remember the grudges though. And so that, and, and, and the thing is, is that they are a historical people, you know, there are people who lives historically and there are people who I think, you know, is more in, this is why they tend to do better and more, more, they're, they're more in tuned with historical reality and what politics actually is, um, especially in a very ideological society like uh, the mid-century West, um, they are a lot more in tune with what real politics actually is. And I suppose this is this is why their opinions that was their personal experiences do so much to form their political opinions, and why actually I think as um, you know now don't don't be like this dude or Rod Dreher and you know recite all of the all of the moments you were humiliated in your childhood uh in order to <laughs> well, like make a political point but at the same time i mean you know the number one thing that influences my personal political opinion are my own personal experiences you know right but he's he's not just rec recounting all the times he's been humiliated he's also um He's also talking about the battle of masculinity between these two groups and uh and whatnot else it's a very uh uh, he's not yeah. just saying he was humiliated this way. He is spelling out and exactly what was in uh, what was in co uh, competition. But uh, from from the chat here, and I'm once again not ignoring super chats. We'll get to those at the end. From the chat here, R. Andrew uh, K. Reed says, uh, um, "Item is mid-century bullet point." So thank you very much. I have not actually uh, come across that as much, but um, that's just because a lot of my books are either newer prints or um, or are very old, one or the other. So. Thank you very much. So, however, having said that, I don't know why he would put these in in bullet point, but uh, I either way. Um, so, um, yeah, he's uh, that that's the uh, story of the playground, and he's going to continue. Quote: I am standing alone in front of the building in which I live. It is late afternoon and getting dark. That day in school, the teacher had asked a surly Negro boy named Quentin a question he was unable to answer. As usual, I had waved my hand eagerly. Be a good boy, get good marks, be smart, go to college, become a doctor. And, the right answer bursting from my lips, I was held up lovingly by the teacher as an example to the class. I had seen Quentin's face, a very dark, very cruel, very oriental-looking face, harden, 
and there had been enough threat in his eyes to make me run all the way home for fear that he might catch me outside. Now, standing idly in front of my own house, I see him approaching from the project accompanied by his little brother, who is carrying a baseball bat and wearing a grin of malicious anticipation. As in a nightmare, I am trapped. The surroundings are secure and familiar, but terror is suddenly present, and there is no one around to help. I am locked to the spot. I will not cry or run away like a sissy, and I stand there, my heart wild, my throat clogged. He walks up, hurls the familiar epithet, and to my surprise, only pushes me. It is a violent push, but not a punch. A push is not serious, uh, is not serious, as serious as a punch. Maybe I can still back out without entirely losing my dignity. Maybe I can still say, hey, come on, Quentin, what do you want to do that for? I didn't do nothing to you. And walk away, not too rapidly. Instead, before I can stop myself, I push him back, a token gesture, and I say, cut that out. I don't want to fight. I ain't got nothing to fight about. As I turn to walk back into the building, the corner of my eye catches the motion of the bat his little brother had, handled, uh, had handed him. I try to duck, but the bat crashes colored lights into my head. The next thing I know, my mother and sister are standing over me, both of them hysterical. My sister... She, who was later to join the Progressive Youth Organization, is shouting for the police and screaming imprecations, uh, sorry, yeah, imprecations uh, at those dirty little black bastards. They take me upstairs. The doctor comes. The police come. I tell them that the boy who did it was a stranger, that he had been trying to get money from me. They do not believe me, but I am too scared to give them Quentin's name. When I return to school a few days later, Quentin avoids my eyes. He knows that I have not squealed, and he is ashamed. I try to feel proud, but in my heart, I know that it was fear of what his friends might do to me that had kept me silent, and not the code of the street. Why would you post your L's like this? <clears throat> yeah, um, he could just say, you know, I, I used to walk the streets, and people would, like, violently assault me from this group, and that's why, I'm, why I dislike them and try to keep my family away from him. I mean, that's what... You know, certainly most other people were saying it about this point in time. This is, if they were, you know, to kind, of, kind of to kind of cut the bush down <laughs> instead of beating around it. This is very, this is a very feminine. Like this is how like a woman writes. You know, like like just just remembering these details and excruciate. This is how a woman like recollects things in writing. You know, um, right. <laughs> well. I mean, as, as he's basically telling you, the, uh, the, the big loss here in all these points is he's getting the masculinity beat out of him by more masculine populations. That's, that's what he wants you, the, the uh, reader, to take away from this. But, um, yeah, it's, a, it's very strange. <clears throat> uh, and, this, and it's only going to get weirder with this next one. So uh, this next one, he says, There's an athletic meet in which the whole of our junior high school is participating. I am in one of the seventh grade rapid advance classes. And segregation has now set in with a vengeance. In the last three or four years of the elementary school, uh, sorry, in the last three or four years of the elementary school from which we have just graduated, each grade had been divided into three classes, according to intelligence. In the earlier grades, the divisions had either been arbitrary or else unrecognized by us as having anything to do with brains. These divisions by IQ, or however it was arranged, had resulted in a preponderance of Jews in the one class, and a corresponding preponderance of Negroes in the threes. With the Italians split unevenly, sorry, split unevenly along the spectrum. At least a few Negroes had always made the ones, just as there had always been a few Jewish kids among the, among the threes, and more among the twos, where Italians dominated. But the junior high's rapid advance class, of which I am now a member, <clears throat> is over overwhelmingly Jewish and entirely white, except for a shy, lonely Negro girl with light skin and reddish hair. Um, and just for people reading, I don't think he ever comes back to this as a, as a uh, necessary point that he just made. He just mentions that uh, with that detail, so once again, a bit strange, but we'll continue. The athletic meet takes place in a city-owned stadium far from the school. It is an important event to which a whole day is given over. The winners are to get those precious little medallions stamped with the New York City emblem that can be screwed into a belt and that prove the wearer uh, that the wearer sorry and that prove the wearer to be a distinguished personage. I am a fast runner, and so I am assigned the position of anchorman on my class's team in the relay race. There are three other seventh grade teams in the race, two of them all Negro, 
as ours is all white. One of the all-Negro teams is very tall. Their anchor man, waiting silently next to me on the line, looks years older than I am, and I do not recognize him. He is the first to get the baton and crosses the finishing line in a walk. Our team comes in second, but a few minutes later we are declared the winners, for it has been discovered that the anchor man on the first place team is not a member of the class. We are awarded the medallions, and the following day our homeroom teacher makes a speech about how proud she is of us being superior athletes as well as superior students. We want to believe we deserve the praise, but we know we could not have won if the other class had not cheated. That afternoon, walking home, I am waylaid and surrounded by five Negroes, among whom is the anchorman of the disqualified team. Give me my medal, he grunts. I do not have it with me, and I tell him so. Anyway, it ain't yours, I say foolishly. He calls me a liar on both counts, and pushes me up against the wall on which we sometimes play handball. Give me my medal, he says again. I repeat that I have left it at home. Let's search him, one of them suggests. He probably hid it in his pants. My panic is now unmanageable. How many times had I been surrounded like this and asked in soft tones, lend me a nickel boy? How many times had I been called a liar for pleading poverty and pushed around or searched or beaten up unless there happened to be someone in the marauding gang like Carl who liked me across the norm enormous divide of hatred and who would therefore say, ah, oh, come on, let's get someone else. This boy ain't got no money on him. I scream at them through tears of rage and self-contempt. Keep your filthy, lousy black hands off of me. I swear I'll get the cops. This is all they need to hear, and the five of them set upon me. They bang me around, mostly in the stomach and on the arms and shoulders. And when several adults loitering near the candy store down the block notice what is going on and begin to shout, they run off and away. I do not tell my parents about the incident. My teammates, who have also been waylaid, each by a gang led by the opposite member of the disqualified team, have had their medallions taken from them, and they never squeal either. For days, I walk home in terror, expecting to be caught again, but nothing happens. The medallion is put away into a drawer, never to be worn by anyone. Why, so, why, does, why does every single one of this tribe write like Kafka? Like, <laughs> like, like it's, 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 it's all just Kafka. That's it. Yeah, and this is a... This is something that I find very strange. That's his. Uh, that's his early childhood experiences with all these. We're we're out of that section now, so you can read into that to to whatever degree you want to. Look, um, look, look I'm not even. I'm not even going to comment on like the you know, on like the 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 uh, the other. The I'm not even going to comment on the perpetrators. All right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even going to comment on that because like that's that's all old hat. Everyone knows what could be said about that. But like you know, I'm I'm just going to focus on the narrator here. I, you know, there's a, a I know I, I, your, your favorite person, there's a Woodrow Wilson quote about how um, <laughs> most people are afraid of mo most people are good, but they're just afraid of someone. And, you know, he doesn't know why, because they're usually just afraid of their own shadow. I mean, you know, he's making he, he's certainly like I, I talk about unreliable narrators and stuff like that. I mean, you know, from what he's telling you, he's certainly making it seem like he's um, he's being uh what is it? He's being singled out and attacked by, you know, these gangs of people and all this other stuff. But it's like, you know, if, if you had like maybe an IQ above above a certain number, you would find how maybe, well, maybe there are ways of, of avoiding this situation continuously. Ha maybe, maybe not. You know, I didn't grow up in a New York City ghetto. Um, so maybe maybe you really don't have any way to avoid it. Um, but I don't know. You, you would think know. that uh, you would think that this group of people who, after having experienced these things multiple times beforehand, would have not walked home alone in this, uh, as he calls it, integrated neighborhood. Yeah, like you know, um, it is very questionable. Um, it's I don't know that that could be an indication that he's bought the narrative. Like he he has no reason. It, why would he walk home alone? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, very. This is very strange. But um, you know, this is a. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, quite a uh, quite something. So this is his justification for his hatred and his uh, uh, envy and whatever else that he's going to tell us about. So uh, we'll we'll continue because now he's going to start extrapolating. So uh, he says, obviously, experiences like these have always been a common feature of childhood life in working class and immigrant neighborhoods, and Negroes do not necessarily figure in them. 
wherever and whatever group uh, and whatever combination, they have lived together in the cities. Kids of different groups have been at war, beating up and being beaten up. I'm just going to skip the next part because uh, I, I don't want this channel to die due to uh, a whole variety of other slurs. <laughs> he says, and even remotely homogenous areas have not been spared the warring of the young. Uh, of the young. One block against another. One gang, called in my day in a pathetic effort at gentility, an SAC, or Social Athletic Club, against another. But the Negro-White conflict had, and no doubt still has, a special intensity, and was conducted with a ferocity unmatched by intramural, intramural white battling. Yeah, um, so when I read this, I thought that was an interesting line of honesty. Um, you know, in Greek, there, you know, something that the right makes an emphasis of how in English there is no um, enemy is just one word. There's no like other word that you can use to describe enemy. But in Greek, there's hostis versus inimicus. Um, which is the public enemy versus the private enemy, you know, right. um, in intramural white battling is, you know, inimicus, it's the private enemy, you know, that's why the intensity is much lower. You know, even if you, even if you, um, what is it, even if there is a significant grievance between two parties, you know, they, there is like this instinctual understanding that at the very least they are of the same group or at least similar enough that perhaps, um, Per, it's it's a matter of what we call in military theory escalation of force, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and it you know it's like it's like you know you wouldn't escalate force, but between uh, you know between blacks and whites who are very obviously just two just different people blatantly like your experience tells you that the only thing that tells you differently is you know decades of media conditioning for you know questionable intentions, but. You know, the only thing that tells you differently is that. And otherwise, it's, you know, very clearly, hey, this is a this is a struggle between two tribes. You are not the same, um, you know, and um, and it's in and, and of course, there's going to be a sort of hostility that exists there that would not exist between, you know, like, you know, let's say a gang of Italians and a gang of, you know, Poles, you know, right. So um, I don't know. Well, yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. And the the other thing as well that he is uh, uh that perhaps is preventing him from jumping to harsher conclusions than just I have a personal problem or whatever else, which is the the title of this essay is a problem, not an observation or what needs to be done or whatever else. It's a problem, something very personal, something very emotional. Um, part part of why uh, he's not going to take this to any any conclusions one way or the other, left or right, is that he's just going to start going on this diatribe about how they're all conditioned. Uh, to see race and whatever else, and how uh, there's really nothing that's actually different between the two groups except for the, the environments in which they were raised. He's going to go on and say this in the essay in retrospective of all of these other things. So, <laughs> um, so despite making that very, very clear point about media conditioning and uh, personal experience kind of showing how it's not exactly that way, um, he's going to buy into it almost entirely. Um, yeah, in he, fact, he's... Uh, come on. No, I was just going to say, yeah, like, you know, and this is the story of the 20th century. It's people essentially choosing not to believe their own lying eyes and choosing to believe what the talking box says, because in actuality, um, the talking box is easier to believe and the talking box is what everyone else believes. And they don't want to stick out and be weird and believe what their own eyes say. Um, they want to believe what the talking box says. Right, exactly. And it's it's also because the talking box has literally everyone behind it. Everyone else believes the talking box. They don't have to suppress their own lying eyes. And this is an individual occurrence across every person, basically. I, I don't... You would have to be uh, specially blind to the events happening in front of you to not have at least some doubt that the narrative from the talking box is uh, not not accurate. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing that's really changed that now is, like, you know, like, Zoomers like to think, oh, we're, we're so much better because we're outside of the narrative. Well, the only real reason that that's happened is just because, you know, to, just the longer that the media is around, the more ways of expressing media. And so now now it's just, you know, the only reason that we're not believing our, the talking box is because, you know, we, we realize that there's like 50 million streams of information and, you know, in order to in order to discriminate properly, we just choose to believe none of them. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, 
yeah, we're, we we've set up the uh we've set up the uh, uh not the environment the setting. We we have the foundations of which he is going to draw his conclusions from now philosophically at least. Um, but he's going he's going to uh, transition now. So in this paragraph, Podhoritz writes, in my own neighborhood. A good deal of animosity existed between the Italian kids, most of whose parents were immigrants from Sicily, and the Jewish kids, who came largely from East, East European immigrant families. Yet everyone had friends, sometimes close, friend, close friends, in the other camp. And we often visited one another's strange-smelling houses, if not for meals, then for a glass of milk. And occasionally for some special event, like a wedding or a wake. If it happened that we divided into warring factions and did battle, it would invariably be half-hearted and soon patched up. Our parents, to be sure, had nothing to do with one another, and were mutually suspicious and hostile. But we, the kids, who all spoke Yiddish or Italian at home, were Americans, or New Yorkers, or Brooklyn boys. We shared a culture, the culture of the street, and at least for a while this culture proved to be more powerful than the opposing cultures of the home. Uh, so this is a this is a very interesting sort of a melting pot way of looking at an American identity. Um, they had uh, they had showed up onto these foreign shores. They spoke uh, completely foreign languages to the uh, the older populations over here. Um, but just because they had less intense battles with each other than they did with the uh, the blacks in New York, that made them Americans. They could tell uh, they could tell that they had unity, uh, being a being new people born into a new culture. Um, this is a very a uh, very watered-down version of an American identity, don't you think, Paul? Yeah, and I mean, and I don't even disbelieve them when they when they when they say that they believe they are American. Oh yeah, of course, you I know, don't either. You know, because because they they speak English in everyday life, and they you know generally outside of their weird ethnic homes, they um you know conform to waspy social conventions when Negroes just don't. Um, but uh, but. The, the the thing is is it's like is it's like it's 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 the idea of divided loyalties like they don't belong to their parents culture but they really don't really belong to the new culture they come to either um and so and so that's a strange place to be right yeah so i and you know once again i don't blame them either just because i've seen this happen in real life uh and when i was in school as well i just uh um they're a bit gung-ho to start calling themselves americans uh, because this is also the same title held by people who have been here for 400 years, um, who who are directly descended from the people who settled the land and developed it for the first time uh, in any sort of European way. Um, they bear the exact same title, so it's yeah. A and I and I mean, you know, at this point, and and things have started arising in recent years. You know, each wave has started getting its own title. You know, you've got founding stock, um, which kind of, you know, has is like the broad reference to anyone who came here before. Like generally it's 1800. That's generally the it's not before the Civil War. It's generally 1800 right. is um, or, or give or give or take five to ten years. Um, and, you know, and then you've got like the 48ers or the, you know, yeah. The, and and the Irish, the old came, immigrants. Yeah. yeah. The Irish who came in the 1830s are kind of thrown under that label. Um, you know, you've got the 48ers uh, and then, and then, you know, after that, you've got the Ellis Islanders, which is starting, you know, uh, towards the, towards the latter end of the civil war, um, you know, and then the Ellis Islanders is really anyone who came before, 1965 and then after 1965 you've just got like you know i don't there's not really a name for them because you know, it's, it's just been a continuous and in, uh inundation yeah yeah essentially and i mean and and you know i think that's that's you know at least america's remaining cultural immune system is kind of it, at least in these spheres is kind of is trying to develop these you know divides to to you know keep the so that the the thing that once existed can be better understood and continued um I was going to say something else. I was going I mean, and at this point, man, like I, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for you, but at this point, even like the founding stock guys have a little bit of Ellis Islander ancestry, you know, um, my, I myself have a, you know, not a, not a majority, but a significant amount of it. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, and it's kind of one of those things where it's like, well, this is just what happens, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I, I used to assume that I did as a child, but I, I, th I think that I was actually, uh, 
one of my family members, my uh, closer family members, took at one of the tests, and um, I think I was actually shown to not have any, which was a shock to me. But well, it's because it, it's in, not normal. It's because <laughs> you live in backwoods Oklahoma, which is like one of these like you know ethnic. It, it, it's one of these like ethnic time capsules. You know, the northern Shenandoah right, yeah. Valley, where my um, where my mother's family came from, was the same. The problem was is that is that her. Um, you know, my grandma was full-blooded Galway Irish, so that's that's just how it is. Um, but yeah, there there are sort of places. You know, a lot of them are in Appalachia or or um, or like you know the the you know the backwoods places uh, are are sort of these these residues of um, of of older peoples. But at the same time, as it's like well the reason heritage American is kind of like a broad stroke as between like, you know, wasps versus white trash, which doesn't really, you know, that distinction isn't really culturally significant anymore because the white trash is just counted, you know, as another part of the colored world. Um, it's, it's, um, and I'm being very candid with this. So forgive me if, you know, this channel gets striked, no, no, uh, but, bad. but, um, but like, at this point, it's it's you know with with um, and you know our, our mutual friend um, Grant Brooks will write about this. You know when he when when he mentions Stoddard and Brooks Adams and Madison Grant, and they kind of saw this uh, as as did people like H. P. Lovecraft in the 1920s that this was kind of as well as Spengler who quotes I think um, I think he quotes Stoddard at length in the Hour of Decision or at least uh, at least plays with the same ideas. Um, is this sort of um, impending conflict between the, you know, as the white world in Europe uh, and America expanded their empire to encompass the entire globe, uh, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What they did by doing that was essentially take everyone who was outside of that and gave them a unifying negative vision. You know, academic agent likes to talk a lot about the negative vision. Well, the negative vision is um, basically the colored world wants to destroy the white world. And after that, you know, things will kind of go back to a sort of equilibrium, but that's basically what's happening here. And so that's why in the United States, people with a significant amount of Ellis Islander ancestry or even full on Ellis Islanders are even to this day, like kind of counted, like they, they very much like Antonin Scalia is a really good example. Um, Antonin Scalia, I know a lot of people are kind of rolling their eyes. All right. But look, I was raised by Fox news, boomer, not boomer, not Fox <laughs> news. I was raised by Fox news conservatives. Okay. Yeah. But I've looked at Scalia's Supreme court decisions and he makes all of these appeals to Anglo-Saxon law. I, I was um, about to say, I don't know why people would roll their eyes since he's one of the few forces on the Supreme court that still actually cares about an Anglo heritage, despite whether or not he has one. Yeah. And I mean, and, and, the, and the thing is, is it's like, yeah, this, this, this dude, this Dago really did understand uh, Anglo-Saxon law and how good it was. And that's the, and that's the thing is it's like, you know, um, and, and, you know, he was, he was kind of a shouted down minority um, most of the time, but you read his decision, like one of the best dissents, like his dissensions are probably what I think, you know, if, you know, if slash when we ever win and we structure, we restructure the Supreme Court and we have to reverse a lot of precedent, uh, a lot of cases that have been decided in the past 75 years, uh, we're going to probably take Scalia's dissensions and just make that the precedent. Because, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the ones I would recommend people read is um, his dissension in, uh, I think it was VMI versus the United States, which was the um, VMI integration decision of 1990s, where the Supreme Court said, VMI can no longer, because it's a senior military college, it can no longer be an all-male college. Um, and Scalia dissents, um, and there's a part of his dissension where he's basically, you know, he's saying without saying these stupid New York ethnics uh, like <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg have no idea what's actually happening outside of New York to the point that they would refer to the University of Virginia campus in Charlottesville as though there were multiple campuses. Um <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, right. and, and, and he does that a lot. He doesn't, you know, if, 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 if you read the legalese, so I, I, I we've kind of gotten a, a little bit far afield here and we're probably going to go back to the essay in a minute, but like, this is something I wanted to emphasize is this is, this is what ideology I think 
distracted from except except for one of course um distracted <laughs> from um and even that one is just totally irrelevant to current circumstances and isn't really ideal or desirable in any context outside of the very brief time which it existed um you know and i disagree with some people on that point um yeah yeah sure I'm, but I, i'm of course not disavowing it though Right. The, the point the point that you're making here in particular about uh, uh, about these uh, Ellis Islanders kind of taking up the mantle as a necessity um, is not one that should be lost on the uh, audience, I hope. Uh, especially, you can see in the old Glory Club, we do have some Ellis Islanders uh, from from that long time period ago. Generations back arrived, uh, arrived in those times. Uh, I, I don't think that anyone, uh, certainly you or I, Paul, would call them subversives or uh, uh, corrosion or anything like that. Uh, they they're very good people. Uh, they, well, they do good well, work. And I, and I mean, the, the thing about it is, is it's like, you know, the, the, the modern day distinction of, of, of who is white and who is not is probably the it's look, it, we are at the point where I'm trying to tell this is why like the whole thing that happened in Texas. And I, I I'm, you know, we're taking a departure from the essay on this point, but the essay <laughs> kind of, the essay is a really good example of, you know, even for the wrong reasons, um, the essay is kind of a good description of where we are, but like in terms of like what historical moment we're in, mm -hmm. um, what is it in terms of historical, in, in terms of his, the historical moment we're in, it is, we are at the civilization level. All right. We are at the civilization level. You know, you want to get into Spangler's thing. This is when, you know, individual cultures stop really having any meaning within the civilization. <laughs> And the only thing that really matters is the group to which all of the cultures have been put in, you know, and this is why, um, this is why like, you know, a lot of, a lot of what happens on the right, like people in a lot of group chats, like, Oh, my answer. And, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, you know, I'm not trying to, I I've done a little bit of this and I'm not trying to disparage familial pride. And I recommend everyone should do this because, you know, you are your ancestors. You need to figure out where you came from. Uh, people who have no interest in their ethnic heritage are, you know, completely, basically dead historically and culturally. They have nowhere they'll go. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, there's also the other side of that, which, you know, people in like, you know, the sons of Confederate veterans or other genealogical societies in which the the genealogy becomes an end unto itself, you know. The, the only way, the only reason you study it is to like get some sense of like, you know, making yourself feel good. Oh, my ancestor did this, that, and the third and all that instead of, you know, using it in service to a much, you know, better goal, something political, religious in nature. And, you know, so, and this is why, and this is why, you know, you don't really, we don't, you know, there's, we've gotten to the point where the distinction between, you know, founding stock ellis islanders and it doesn't really matter because they vote the same way you know they they generally vote the same way they they want the same things and they recognize the same problems at least in a in a you know in a you know existential way you know in terms right. of domestic policy they'll probably vote differently but in, in in terms of the existential crisis we are currently facing which is and i do not want to like underemphasize this the existential crisis we are currently facing is the extinction of uh, European derived civilization. Like that's 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 what we're currently like. That's that's what happens if we lose. I don't want to you know you know draw this right here, but like and this is this is why you know in wartime, in a wartime situation, um, war war wartime situations are the most tolerant societies that exist. Um, right. Let me yeah. just say that right now. And that's kind of why, you know, something like, a, you know, like, and I've, I've been talking for a while, we can come back to the essay. And if you want to, you know, if you if you think I'm, 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 I'm full no, of no, garbage, no, no. just, just, uh, just uh, we got we'll go back to the essay when your points finished. Yeah, it's just it's just the, the, the whole thing I'm trying to say here is it's like, well, look, you know, um, this dude, even though he comes to the completely wrong conclusions, is basically if you look at his line of thinking like the you know his inputs were kind of the same as our outputs or as our inputs rather um the difference is is his priors all right this is the difference right, yeah. this is this is what you know i, I was I'll, I'll finish it on this then we can go back i was recently talking to a friend of mine who has a um who has a family member who's involved in like some high up uh think tank all right 
Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm not going to get too much into details, uh, but a friend of mine, I mean, you know, being from Northern Virginia, like I am, that's a lot of people, but he's kind of on our thing. And he was telling me about how this dude was recommending to him or saying he was reading a bunch of the books for his, you know, theory work that we read, you mm-hmm. know, people like, uh, you know, Peter Zihan is the first one who comes to mind. I know we kind of like scoff at him, but basically uh, people at the strategic level of the U.S. government are reading the same books we are. All right. So they're getting the same inputs that we are. And that kind of made me scared that we're at the same level as U.S. government planners in terms of the material we consume. We're at the same level they are. But the difference is, is that they are coming to completely different conclusions that we are given the given the same inputs. And so the only conclusion I can draw is that their ideological priors are different than us. Right. right? Yeah. And that's that's a uh, that's been the whole story of these neoconservative essays in particular is that they are a. Uh, they're basically just stating fact as we would even see it. Um, and then they come to these completely strange conclusions because they still want this like New Deal world from nineteen the late 1930s to the early 1940s. And they're trying to impose that upon the 60s and the 70s, even the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I... We, we can keep going. <laughs> we, we, we shall keep going. Um, so Podhortz continues, Why? Why should it have been so different as between the Negroes and us? How was it born? In, uh, how was it born in upon us so early, white and black alike, that we were enemies beyond any possibility of reconciliation? Why did we hate one another so? I suppose if I tried, I could answer those questions more or less adequately from the perspective of what I have since learned. I could draw upon James Baldwin. What better witness is there to describe the sense of entrapment that poisons the soul of the Negro with hatred for the white man whom he knows to be his jailer? On the other hand, if I wanted to understand how the white man comes to hate the Negro, I could call upon the psychologists who have spoken of the guilt that white Americans feel towards Negroes, and that turn and that turns into hatred for lack of acknowledging itself as guilt. Uh, this is a uh, I, I don't know that we've especially need to comment on this, but just to note it, it's a very strange way of uh, uh, looking at why why people might dislike them uh, if that if that was the mainstream position at Podhortz's time. Uh, but he'll continue. These are plausible answers, and certainly there is truth in them. Yet, when I think back upon my own experience of the Negro and his of me, I find myself troubled and puzzled, much as I was as a child when I heard that all Jews were rich and all Negroes persecuted. How could the Negroes in my neighborhood have regarded the whites across the street and across the corner as jailers? On the whole, the whites were not so poor as the Negroes, but they were quite poor enough, and the years were years of depression. As for white hatred of the Negro, how could guilt have had anything to do with it? What share had these Italian and Jewish immigrants in the enslavement of the Negro? What share had they, downtrodden people themselves, breaking their own necks to eke out a living, in the exploitation of the Negro? So, he's questioning these things, but uh, you can place your bets now in the audience as to whether he's actually going to uh, uh, refute that exploitation is a cause or any of these other things. I, you, you can place your bets now as to how likely he is to repudiate those, or instead to just uh, explain them in a different way than the mainstream. Um, but he continues, No, I cannot believe that we hated each other back there in Brooklyn, because they thought of us as jailers, and we felt guilty towards them. But does it matter, given the fact that we all went through an unrepresentative confrontation? I think it matters profoundly. For if we manage the job of hating each other so well without benefit of the aids to hatred that are supposedly at the root of this madness everywhere else, it must mean that the madness is not yet properly understood. I am far from pretending that I understand it, but I would insist, I would insist that no view of the problem will begin to approach the truth unless it can account, account for a case like the one I have been trying to describe. Are the elements of any such view available to us? At least two, I would say, are. One of them is a point. Is, sorry, one of them is a point we frequently come across in the work of James Baldwin, and the other is a related point always stressed by psychologists who have studied the mechanisms of prejudice. Baldwin tells us that one of the reasons Negroes hate the white man is that the white man refuses to look at him. The Negro knows that in white eyes all Negroes are alike; they are faceless and therefore all uh, altogether and not altogether human. The psychologists, in turn, tell us that the white man hates the Negro because he tends to project those wild impulses that he fears in himself onto an alien group, which he then punishes with his contempt. 
What Baldwin does not tell us, however, is that the principle of facelessness is a two-way street, and can operate in both directions, with no difficulty at all. Thus, in my neighborhood, in Brooklyn, I was as faceless to the Negroes as they were to me. And if they hated me, because I never looked at them, I must also have hated them for never looking at me. To the Negroes, my white skin was enough to define me as the enemy, and in a war, it is, the only uni it is only the uniform that counts and not the person. So this whole, uh, this whole section here is, uh, as you can see, he's not actually trying to uh, repudiate any of the knowledge, so-called knowledge from the civil rights uh, leaders and whatnot else. He's just trying to flip it around, uh, which is, a, uh, hopefully, as we've all seen, a losing strategy for anything uh, traditional. Not that Pod Horitz here is trying to be traditional or even conservative yet at the time. He would still call himself a liberal who is just repudiating the new left. Um, but this essay, the reason we're covering this essay is because it is still used. He wrote a postscript on it because it was so popular, because people would point to it. This is sort of the foundation, uh, as we're going to see later when he gets more explicit, for neoconservative-inspired peoples to um, um, actually start saying that the, the, the way to fix uh, group disparities is to ignore them. It's colorblindness and all this other stuff. Uh, this is where you start seeing the, that really articulated by someone that's not... Uh, uh, not just a rabid uh, civil rights communist, basically. Uh, this, this is Pod Horitz that's going to be coming to these conclusions. Um, so, uh, he's going to continue. So, with the mechanism of projection that the psychologists talk about, it too works in both directions at once. There is no question that the psychologists are right about what the Negro represents symbolically to the white man. For me as a child, the life lived on the other side of the playground and down the block of, on Ralph Avenue seemed the very embodiment of the values of the street. Free, independent, reckless, brave, masculine, erotic. I put the word erotic last, though it is usually stressed above all the others because in fact it came last, in consciousness and as an importance. What mainly counted for me about Negro kids of my own age was that they were bad boys. There were plenty of bad boys among the whites. This was, after all, a neighborhood with a long tradition of crime as a career open to aspiring talents. But the Negroes were really bad, bad in a way that beckoned to one and made one feel inadequate. We all went home every day for a lunch of spinach and potatoes. They roamed around during lunch hour, munching on candy bars. In winter, we had to wear itchy woolen hats and mittens and cumbersome galoshes. They were, bare uh, were bareheaded and loose as they pleased. We rarely played hooky, or got into serious trouble in school for all our street corner bravado. They were defiant, forever staying out to do what delicious things, forever making disturbances in class and in the halls, forever being sent to the principal and returning uncalled. But most important of all, they were tough, beautifully, enviably tough not giving a damn for anyone or anything, to hell with the teacher, the truant officer, sorry, the truant officer, the cop, to hell with the whole of the adult world that held us in its grip, and that we had never had the courage to rebel against, except sporadically and in petty ways. Uh, so, uh, Paul, I think it's pretty clear to say uh, that uh, hopefully it's becoming clear why we might have compared this to Rod Dreher at the beginning. Um... Uh... Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't have anything to say about this. Um, you know, I'm I don't I don't want to. Yeah. Hey, you don't you don't want to talk yeah. about Pod Horitz accounting how the uh, the black kids were erotic and masculine and uh, uh, inspired inadequacy in the in the Jewish population. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not prudish. All right, in, in, in the sense of like, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of things like this, but at the same time, it's just, it's not something I want to talk about. Well, this yeah, is, this how, is... how, how did this make it into a political essay? <laughs> how? This is, and not only a political essay, this is, this is one of the main people of neoconservatives, the, uh, uh, of neoconservatism. The, the thumbnail for this video is Pod Horitz getting a, uh, uh, was it, is it the Presidential Medal of Freedom? Or the, I think that's what it is, uh, being awarded that by George Bush for his work as a, uh, uh, as a good journalist. Um, uh, this is, this is the work that he's doing. This is the political thought he's inspiring. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe Rod Dreher is just carrying on this tradition of, Really, really weird, dumb political ideas. I, I don't know, but uh, we have more to get through. Bot Hortz writes, 
This is what I saw and envied and feared in the Negro. This is what finally made him faceless to me, though some of it, of course, was actually there. The psychologists also tell us that the alien group, which becomes the object of a projection, will tend to respond by trying to live up to what is expected of them. But what, on his side, did the Negro see in me that made me faceless to him? Did he envy me my lunches of spinach and potatoes, and my itchy woolen caps, and my prudent behavior in the face of authority, as I envied him his new noontime candy bars, and his bare head in the winter, and his magnificent rebelliousness? Did those lunches and caps spell for him the prospect of power and riches in the future? Did they mean that they were the possibilities open to me that were denied to him? Very likely they did. But if so, one, only, one also supposes that he feared the impulses within himself towards submission to authority, no less powerfully than I feared my impulses and myself towards defiance. If I represented the jailer to him, it was not because I was oppressing him or keeping, keeping him down. It was because I symbolized for him the dangerous and probably pointless temptation towards greater repression, just as he symbolized to me the equally perilous tug towards greater freedom. I personally was to be rewarded for this, uh, for this repression with a new and better life in the future, but how many of my friends paid an even higher price and were given only gall in return? <laughs> we have it on authority of James Baldwin that all Negroes hate whites. I am trying to suggest that on their side all whites, all American whites that is, are sick in their feelings about Negroes. There are Negroes, no doubt, who would say that Baldwin is wrong. But I suspect them of being less honest than he is, just as I suspect whites of self-deception who tell me they have no special feelings toward Negroes. Special feelings about color are a contagion to which white Americans seem susceptible, even when there is nothing in their background to account for the susceptibility. Thus, everywhere we look today in the North, we find the curious phenomenon of white middle-class liberals with no previous personal experience of Negroes, people of whom Negroes have always been faceless in virtue rather than faceless in vice, discovering that their abstract commitment to the cause of Negro rights will not stand the test of a direct confrontation. We find such, flee such people fleeing in droves to the suburbs as the Negro population in the inner city grows. And when they stay in the city, we find them sending their children to private school, rather than to the integrated public school in the neighborhood. We find them resisting the demand that gerrymandered school districts be rezoned for the purpose of overcoming de facto segregation. We find them judiciously considering whether the Negroes, for their own good of course, are not perhaps pushing too hard. We find them clucking their tongues over Negro militancy. We find them speculating on the question of whether there may or may not, whether they may, sorry. We find them speculating on the question of whether there may not, after all, be something in the theory that the races are biologically different. We find them saying that it will take a very long time for Negroes to achieve full equality, no matter what anyone does. We find them deploring the rise of black nationalism, and expressing the solemn hope that the leaders of the Negro community will discover ways of containing the impatience and incipient violence within the Negro ghettos. So before we continue here, um, this is um, this is sort of like the neocon, uh, liberal, mugged by reality, conservative thing that he's saying right here. He is illustrating this in the 60s for you, the audience. He is saying that all of these great liberal journalists, all these great liberal figures are encountering the reality of their cause, and they are not surviving it. They are having second thoughts. They're maybe slowing down just a little bit, keeping the cause, keeping the same underlying ideas, uh, but they're going to start toning it down. Maybe things are going a bit too far now that they have to deal with it. So, uh, th this is a, a hallmark of neoconservative uh, ideas here. Uh, Paul, did you want to say something? No, I mean, I mean... Um... This is just this is just um, what is it? It's like uh, this is this is like the origination of the Democrats are the real racists, isn't it? Um, yeah, certainly you can find uh, hints of that in here. This is a. Uh, I I hope that everyone's starting to see uh, these common neoconservative rhetorical points. Uh, they're encountering reality. They are maturing. They can give a better answer than everyone else because of their maturity and their encounters with reality that all of these other people left and right just haven't had. <clears throat> this is going to be one of the main ones. Like last week, we covered the uh, uh, basically the uh, the contempt for the youth uh, that Irving Crystal certainly had when discussing welfare. Um, the week beforehand, we discovered we talked about the same theme we are now with Kirkpatrick describing the uh, the naivety of all the other groups. Um, and then the the week before that, we <clears throat> we discussed a very similar thing with economics 
um, where these uh, neoconservatives were the realists, once again, the matured people who were going to tell people how to really handle American economics. Uh, that, this is what we're coming across now, earlier than all the other ones. Um, Podhoritz is, telling, uh, is about to tell us that experiences with reality and his maturity are going to give us the answers. And it's going to be conservative because it's real, uh, at least according to them. So, uh, we'll continue, and then, uh, you know, once again, Paul, just stop me at any point that you have a comment. Um, Pod Hortz continues, But that is by no means the whole story. There is also the phenomenon of what Kenneth Rexroth call, uh, once called crow-gymism. There are the broken-down white boys like Vivaldo Moore in Baldwin's Another Country, who go to Harlem in search of sex, or simply to brush up against something that looks like primitive vitality, and who are so often punished by the Negroes they meet for crimes that they would never, that they would have, sorry, and who are so often punished by the Negroes they meet for crimes that they would have been uh, the last ever to commit, and of which they themselves would have been so, as sorry victims as any of the Negroes who take it out on them. Very strange sentence structure, but uh, hopefully people can get what the, the point is there. There are the writers and intellectuals and artists who romanticize Negroes and pander to them, assuming a guilt that is not properly theirs. And there are all the white liberals who permit Negroes to blackmail them into adopting a double standard of moral judgment, and who lend themselves, again, assuming the responsibility for crimes they never committed, to cunning and contemptuous exploitation by Negroes they employ or try to befriend. And what about me? What kind of feelings do I have about Negroes today? What happened to me from Brooklyn, who grew up fearing and envying and hating Negroes? Now that Brooklyn is behind me, do I fear them and envy them and hate them still? The answer is yes, but not in the same proportions, and certainly not in the same way. I now live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where there are many Negroes and many Puerto Ricans, and there are nights where I experience the old apprehensiveness again, and there are streets that I avoid when I am walking in the dark, as there were streets that I avoided when I was a child. I find that I am not afraid of Puerto Ricans, but I cannot restrain my nervousness whenever I pass a group of Negroes standing in front of a bar or sauntering down the street. I know now, as I did not, as I did not know when I was a child, that power is on my side, that the police are working for me and not for them. And knowing this, I feel ashamed and guilty, like the good liberal I have grown up to be. Yet the twinges of fear and the resentment they bring and the self-contempt they arouse are not to be gainsaid. Um, so. I don't know that this has necessarily uh, aged well, that the police are working was, against mobs of violent thugs. It was true back in those days. Yeah, it, it, it was certainly true back in those days. I just don't think this is a... This is probably aged very poorly compared to the rest of the essay, which is generally not aged well either. Yeah. I mean, was it like... The, the, this is just the only natural conclusion you can come to if you've been coded to be a good liberal with the um, you know, liberal social values of the mid-century... And then you have to confront the reality of it, um, you know, and, and it's this cognitive dissonance, right? You know, um, and if you don't have the proper literacy to overcome that cognitive dissonance or, or you know, certain ideas are verboten to you or just unthinkable or the, the talking box or the academic consensus goes against it, then, you know, the only, the only possible conclusion um, that you can come to given these, you know, given this education, this upbringing, uh, your ideological priors, the inputs he gets, the only output you can get is, um, is, well, clearly we haven't been doing enough to raise them up. Clearly we haven't co been committed enough to the idea. You right. Know? Yeah. It's, That's it's our problem. Conclusion. Yeah. Right. You know, so say what, you, and say what you will about liberals and leftists, um, and other people like this, um, say what you will. It's, uh, how should I say it's, um, um, was it at the very least, they are ideologically consistent. They are internally consistent in what they believe. Um, it's not what they believe is not correct. It's just, it is, it has to be internally consistent. Um, and in many ways, the conservatives of today, which are kind of these neocons without like the ideological backing, uh, cause real conservatism doesn't really exist. The, real right wingism in the United States is de facto illegal. Um, it's just, it's not even ideologically consistent. Right. Yeah. And that's, hopefully people can see this. This is why they never really made a manifesto or something. They're very heterogeneous. They don't believe the same things. They're just in this sort of group of, uh, disaffected liberals, disaffected Trotskyites, um, who have encountered reality and they think that that now makes them right wing. 
Um, so we're going to be all over the place, and certainly we are here. Um, because also, you're going to have other essays in this book from like Thomas Sowell talking about affirmative action. I doubt he's probably going to be speaking in the same way that Pod Hordes is going to be here in a moment. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, well, let's keep going, though. He says, why, but envy, why envy? And hatred, why hatred? Here again, the intensities have lessened, and everything has been complicated and qualified by the guilts and the resulting overcompensations <clears throat> that are the heritage of the enlightened middle-class world of which I am now a member. Yet, just as in childhood, I envied Negroes for what seemed to me their superior masculinity. So I envied them today for what seems to me uh, their superior physical grace and beauty. I have come to value physical grace very highly, and I am now capable of aching with all my being when I watch a Negro couple on the dance floor, or a Negro playing baseball or basketball. They are on the kind of terms with their own bodies that I should like to be on with mine. And for that precious quality, they seem blessed to me. <laughs> so, add this to the long list of weird parts about the essay, because we have Pod Hordes here claiming that he is envious of the, of the black population for their physical beauty and you're, grace you're and all this <laughs> what was that you're gonna have to put a disclaimer for future for people who watch this on the replay yeah yeah <laughs> don't watch this with like young people around or you know don't watch this in front of your parents or whatever this is a very strange don't i i would certainly be embarrassed if i was listening to this uh and heard heard this being read off um in in, in the chat simone aguilar how do you think i think i feel uh, how do you think we feel up here all right. you know, <laughs> I'm reading this out in front of an audience that will probably be in the thousands by the time this video plateaus in viewership. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, man. Um, but this, this will probably again, be one of your most viewed videos. I, I hope so, because this is what the neoconservatives wrote. Uh, they inspired multiple presidential administrations. Their philosophy was the, the normal center of right-wing thought in America for the longest time. Um, and in the foreword for this section, this is a as I mentioned in other streams, this uh, essay collection is divided up into broad uh, topical sections. This is the first one called Liberalism uh, Confronts uh, Simplicity. Um, and it has a quote in the in that section right beforehand, sort of like a prelude, uh, where Moynihan, which is the next, uh, the next person in this section uh, with his report on the Negro family, um, Moynihan saying that they were uh, being called racist by everyone, and even though all their friends agreed with them, they didn't want to be called racist either. But these great people at the National Review were backing them and saying that they were right, these great conservatives. So maybe maybe the conservatives were the ones in the right all along. This is the, this is the thought process. These are the people behind all of this uh, that, that are pushing this upon the population. Um, I would... Uh, I would be inclined to say that this essay falls under the uh, products of uh, spiteful mutants, if you will. Uh, this is not normal. And the only reason that this was pushed was because gatekeepers and other non-normal people had uh, basically had a stranglehold over the American right at this point in time. Uh, but that, that's my opinion. Regardless of what you think about what I'm saying, this is what the neoconservatives wrote. We'll, we'll continue. Uh, we'll continue on our quest to find... Uh... <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's like, what is it, um... You can even start to see some of the origins, you know, how people talk about the current religion of the regime as black people. Like, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's not even like a, honestly, that's not even like an overstatement. You know, the, the, the current thing that is worshipped and treated as like living holy men um, is black people, you know, and, and you can see where this like, you know, in, in, in statements like this, all right, you can kind of see where this is, uh, you, you you can see where this originates. Right? It's, this, it's, it's this, um, and really, and he, even his understanding of masculinity, um, like was it like like I, I kind of I'm gonna touch that real quick. All right. Yeah, yeah. The epitome of masculinity has been you know basically dragged down through the mud, and it's this very what is it? It's this very um, you know, when he's talking about how they're more masculine than him. The epitome of masculinity is God, is, is God the Father. That's the epitome of masculinity because God is a male because he tells us he is a male, all right? Um, and uh, what is it? And, and, and what, is, what is a father? It's a, it's a creator, a guide, um, a, a dispenser of wisdom, um, a reassurer, a teacher, all these other things. That's the epitome of masculinity, all right, as we understand it. You know, it is, it, it's the man, it's the man who 
is unwavering, who does not move. All right. But he has this very, what is it? It's as a matter of fact, what he calls masculinity, it actually kind of it's it's indicative of the degrading morals of the West at the time. Um of like how masculinity is understood as, as, and, and, you know, this is the, the mass dispersal of Freudianism as an idea society wide, but essentially, um, you know, what is it? Nothing is really understood outside the con because religion has of course been removed at this point. No one really has faith in anything anymore. Right. Um, and, um, and, you know, it has been replaced by, you know, the one thing that they can like, uh, what is it? The one thing that, <laughs> I just read something. Uh, the one, the one thing that um, uh, what is it that they can um, you know, cling to is the biological reality of oh, cosmic accident. Sex is the only thing that matters, and so you know, and so essentially, uh, their image of masculinity is porn. You know, that is that, right. They have replaced. They have replaced w what normal lived reality and what the what the creator of good for, they they've replaced that as normal with you know oh what happens in porn is normal we you know and 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 i, I once again don't don't want to get your channel striked but like this is this is there might be a connection yeah. between the groups there and the groups writing this <laughs> yeah yeah so um yeah this is a I, I'm glad that you uh, actually uh, commented on that, just because, especially to Christians, you, you mentioned God being the Father. Uh, you, you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, another thing that a father is supposed to be, uh, which, once again, God is everything he is supposed to be. That That's the, the, the template for perfection. Uh, one of the things that a father is supposed to do is impart some a sense of masculinity onto their, onto their sons. Yeah. So... Uh, one, once yeah one, once that's gone uh what's the what's the standard for masculinity if not this uh uh this omnipotent omniscient and omnipresent being well and you know uh, that, that arbits right and wrong yeah that's true and the thing what is it you know masculinity has to be taught it's not something anyone is inherently born with um as we can clearly see with the newer generations exactly you know it, as a matter of what is, is uh, you know there was this well understood, you know, all children were kind of treated like women and women were treated like children and men, you know, this is, you know, initiation rituals were a cultural technology to kind of bring this about, but it's kind of like a sliding scale. There is no, you know, there is no like one moment where you go from being a boy to being a man. And a lot of people say that you never really become one. You just get better at it. Um, but like, this is the whole thing of like the arrested development we currently have now with a lot of societies is that, you know, basically this cultural knowledge of what being a man is, of what masculinity is, has been lost. And people are kind of cargo culting. Um, you know, this is where the, oh, being a man is watching NFL and drinking beer and all this other stuff. Um, now, I like I like football. Don't get me wrong. You know, this is, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to probably watch the Super Bowl, um, if, if anything, just to see the Chiefs lose. Um, but you know, but like, like masculinity is not this, like, you know, like, like a good example is like, you know, I, I loathe bringing this up, but like, uh, in, in parks and rec, the Ron Swanson character, um, sure, yeah. that, that is like a cargo culting of what masculinity is. It's just like, right. It, it's the form without any of the substance. Exactly. You know, and, and the thing is, is that the form the form has to be taught. It has to be understood. It has to be felt out and it has to be reinforced. And that's what good, that's what fatherhood is. Um, and that originally, the original source of that does come from God. So, you know, right. I'll stop talking now. Well, no, no, to, to that point specifically, there is a reason why masculinity comes about. If you do not feel those reasons, you will only be an imitation of it. That's, that's why you have very masculine settler depictions from the 1600s, and you're struggling to recreate even a semblance of that today. Uh, it's just because the reasons have been removed. And this is something else as well. I don't even necessarily think that's just because of technology or what whatnot else. I think that's just because it's being socially engineered out of the population by other forces. Um, it, technology can never remove the struggles of human life. They can, they can make certain things better, but we will always find something else that has to be encountered uh, with with brute force, with brute knowledge, or anything else, any of these other masculine traits, well, logical calculation, strength, uh, athleticism, or what, whatnot else, that will always be present with humans so long as we are as finite beings. 
Well, and and that's the thing, you know, is it's like is it, and this is why the transhumanists and the AI singularity people kind of don't get it. Um, is is look, you know, all problems are human problems. All problems are human problems. Um, and um, and this is why, you know, a couple of a little while ago, and this caused some chagrin. This is why I made the tweet about trying to figure out a a, a right wing version of doing HR. Because at the very least right now, HR is the department in companies that have to do explicitly with the human capital at the company. Now, maybe maybe not HR as a concept, maybe not like as we imagine it, but as like, uh, like the company's personnel department or, you know, in military terms, what the S1 would be on the staff. Like, you know, the management would be the traditional term for it. Yeah, I mean, and and the the thing is though is that like with with the introduction of technology, uh, personnel management has kind of been separated. Uh, as like this, it's its own thing from, you know, the actual management of business operations, you know, operations and, and personnel have kind of become two separate categories. And maybe, maybe that's, maybe that was a bad move. Maybe that's something that should be undone just as how the separation of politics and, eco- and economics was a bad move and that neither of them should be studied separately and, and programs should all be integrated into a sort of political economy course. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's also the case. Um, but you know, that, that's just, that's just something I wanted to bring up in relation to that. And I'm going to, and we can, we can keep going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I hope that we've uh, made our points on masculinity and, uh, maybe, maybe that's a discussion after the Neocon series is over, uh, that, that would be nice to have. Yeah. Um, well, we'll get back into the weirdness of pod Horace. However, this, uh, this poor guy in the chat says that he's late joining. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have a lot to catch up on and, uh, this is going to be a fun place for you to just pop into. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, Podhorts continues. The hatred I still feel for Negroes is the hardest of all the old feelings to face or admit, and it is the most hidden and the most overlarded by the conscious attitudes into which I have succeeded in willing myself. It no longer has, as for me it once did, any cause or justification, except perhaps that I am constantly being denied my right to an honest expression of the things I earned the right as a child to feel. How, then, do I know that this hatred has never entirely disappeared? I know it from the insane rage that can stir in me the thought of Negro anti-Semitism. I know it from the disgusting uh, pr- prurience sorry, uh, that can stir in me uh, at the sight of a mixed couple. And I know, it, I-, I know it from the violence that can stir in me whenever I encounter that special brand of paranoid touchiness to which many Negroes are prone. This, then, is where I am. It is not exactly where I think all other white liberals are, but it cannot be so very far away either. And it is because I am convinced uh, that we white Americans are, for whatever reason, it no longer matters, so twisted and sick in our feelings about Negroes that I despair of the present push towards integration. If the pace of progress were not a factor here, there would perhaps be no cause for despair. Time and the law, and even the international political situation, are on the side of the Negroes. And ultimately, therefore, victory, of a sort anyway, must come. But from everything we have learned, from observers who ought to know, uh, pace has become an imp- as important to the Negroes as substance. They want equality, and they want it now. And the white world is yielding to their demands only as much as and as fast as it is absolutely being compelled to do. The Negroes know this in the most concrete terms imaginable, and it is thus becoming increasingly difficult to buy them off with rhetoric and promises and pious assurances of support. And so, within the Negro community, we find more and more people declaring, as Harold R. Isaacs recently put it, that they want out. People who say that integration will never come, or that it will take a hundred or thousand years to come or that it will come at too high a price in suffering and struggle for the pallid and sodden life of the American middle class, that at the very best it may bring. So, this is interesting, uh, this whole paragraph. You can draw a lot of inferences from it, but I would like to point the audience to something that is just being taken uncritically by neoconservatives to this very day. Uh, it, It is this Whiggish concept that history is marching forward in a progressive direction. And sure, he couches this to make it seem like it could change at any point in time, but Pod Horitz is absolutely assured, as are most white liberals that he knows, uh, that history is always marching in favor of the Negroes if only they would stop being as radical. If they would just quiet down, they would get what they want just over time, because history is always marching in their direction. 
Um, well, okay, so so in in defense of the Whiggish concept of history, all right, it's not that's not the problem itself. The problem is is that the Christian aspect of the Whiggish concept of history was removed here, and it has been well, replaced with something else. Well, no, because I've, I I think that there is is a problem here, just because of you can number one, you can clearly see in history that everything is not always marching in this leftward sense of progress. But yeah, but as to the Christian view, that's only part of part of Christianity. You know, there, yeah, there are some who aren't post millennials. Yeah, you, you, and, that, and that's fair enough. But like, you know, what is it? But it's like, what is it? Everyone, what is it here? I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, what is it to, um, what is it to organize my thoughts properly on this? Um, the point is, whatever he is saying here, yes, this is this is stupid. This is ahistorical. He doesn't understand what's happening. Um, and he doesn't understand that not only is what he's asking for impossible and what is is taken as a good is impossible, but it's also not a good. All right. Um, that the what is it that the um, idea of equality between these two peoples is possible or good. That's not that's not it. Right. right? Yeah. The, the, the problem the problem is, is that this idea of a forward motion of history has only recently been given a leftward tinge. All right. Okay, sure. That's, yeah. that's, that's the bait and switch that was pulled. Everyone kind of wants a forward motion. Everyone wants things to get better generally. That's what that's what progress really means is things are getting better. All right. You know, you know, you talk like technological innovation gives us more man hours in the day. You know, yes, problems don't go away, but we are able to do more at a greater scale than we were at a previous point. No one is against that, really, at the end of the day, unless you're some sort of Luddite. And and even then, even then, the Luddites think that they are actually doing progress by decreasing in technological sophistication. But right, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right, yes. Most, the, most groups will want some uh, forward motion of history in some direction that they find positive. Yeah, yeah. The, the, where the bait and switch occurs is that this idea was joined at the hip with a leftist idea of uh, not not a with a marxist idea of whatever you know the, the the social utopia brown world of everything is you know that's that's the problem here and the neocons find a lot of their ideological origins within trotskyites all right and that's where this is brought over all right this is yes. this is and, and you know another bait and switch was pulled on the right. If you just slap the word conservative on it, people assume it's right wing. They don't look at the priors. They don't look at the origins. All right. So this is why when people say, "Oh, well, there isn't really," there's only one party in the United States. Yes, there are currently two leftist parties. One finding its origin in old Marxists. One finding its origin in Trotskyites. Um, you know, currently in the power in the in the channels of government. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I, I will. Uh, I should probably clarify that a bit more, just because I. I just assume that whenever a right winger mentions Whig history, it's the the modern sense. So, uh, yes, he he has leftist priors, and he is applying a a, a progressive uh, attitude towards the development of history. And to be perfectly honest, the only people who do not have a uh, attitude that history is largely positively developing, um, as you mentioned, even the Luddites fall into this uh, trap a lot. Uh, are probably some of the uh, old continental uh, reformers of Protestantism. Because if I remember correctly, I think they had an idea that the farther that time got away from Christ being on the earth, uh, the more degenerated that everything would come in its, uh, everything would become in its essence. Like, I think that might be the only group, the sort of chiastic view of history that actually truly believes in a uh, degenerating decline in history. And that's, and that's a debate much better held by a church council, Nana. <laughs> than on a live stream yeah yeah i i wasn't i wasn't bringing that up for you and i to debate it i just think that uh, perhaps the audience might find that somewhat interesting but um but yes the, the thing that i want to point out here is that this is a very left-wing view of progressive history that is being carried over into something labeled neoconservatism or conservatism as it's just known today uh, even traditionalists are falling into this uh this ideology so really it's shape-shifting it's uh, it 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 wears many masks. Yeah, it's it's the the thing. The problem is, is it's, and this is why it's it's so important for everyone to kind of understand what the ideological priors are, because uh, the only Christian way to look at history is linear. All right, Christ literally breaks time in half. Um, 
uh, that that's the only possible. And yes, you can look at like, you know, there's like seasons. There is a, you know, there is a cyclical aspect to it, but it's not like this. It's not like this um, pagan way of looking at history, which is this Ouroboros just eating its tail, this Nietzschean eternal recurrence. That's not correct. Um, uh, and, and so, and, the, but what, what we're talking about here with the sort of leftist, uh, hijacking of this progressive view, uh, the Whiggish view predates, uh, Hegelian dialectical materialism, left Hegelian dialectical materialism. This is what, this is the ideological framework that's being used is dialectical materialism to essentially, you know, eventually, eventually we're going to make it to the perfect workers utopia or the perfect race utopia or whatever, you know, where no suffering ever happens at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with that said, I, I hope that uh, both you and I have our points across the audience, at least in how to, uh, how to analyze this. There's, there's a lot of priors going unchecked and they aren't going to change and they still haven't changed today amongst the so-called conservatives. Um, and this is something that I think that I said yesterday, maybe on Twitter or something, but it might be good to uh, repeat in, in this live stream. If you want to know if something is neoconservative or not, a good heuristic is just to ask, how would the old right respond to this situation? Any figure from the old right. They're a varied group as well, um, but they usually will not come to neoconservative solutions for issues. If the old right would respond differently than the current conservative movement was, you are dealing with the neoconservative aspect of that movement. If you're coming across dissidents or traditionalists or whomever else, outsiders, who respond as the old right did to certain situations, that's not the neoconservative position. Uh, that, that, that might be a good heuristic to, uh, uh, to actually come across and uh, filter out these claims from the neocons as they have per, uh, pervaded the mainstream discourse. Um, we will continue, however. Podhoritz writes, The most numerous, influential, and dangerous movement that has grown out of Negro despair with the goal of integration is, of course, the black Muslims. This movement, whatever else we may say about it, must be credited with one enduring achievement, it inspired James Baldwin to write an essay, which deserves to be placed among the classics of our language. Everything Baldwin has ever been trying to tell us is distilled here into a statement of overwhelming persuasiveness and prophetic magnificence. Baldwin's message is, and always has been simple, it is this, color is not a human or personal reality, it is a political reality. And Baldwin's demand is correspondingly simple, color must be forgotten lest we all are smited with a vengeance that does not really depend upon, and cannot really be executed by, any person or organization, and that cannot be prevented by any police force or army. Historical vengeance, a cosmic vengeance, based on the law that we recognize when we say, whatever goes up, must come down. The black Muslims, Baldwin portrays, as a sign and a warning to the intransigent white world. They come to proclaim how deep is the Negro's d disaffection with the white world and all of its works, and Baldwin implies that no American Negro can fail to respond somewhere in his being to their message, that the white man is the devil, that Allah has doomed him to destruction, and that the black man is about to inherit the earth. Baldwin, of course, knows that this, ni this nightmare inversion of the racism from which the black man has suffered can neither win nor even point to the neighborhood in which victory might be located. For in this view, the neighborhood of victory lies in exactly the opposite direction, the transcendence of color through love. So this is where we get the race blind, uh, the left are becoming the real racist uh, tripe uh, from the neoconservatives, is this right there. They are coming off of the left wing of the civil rights movement, talking about how color isn't real, um, it, it doesn't have any physical aspects to it other than the color itself, um, it is just something that politics uh, finds to be useful, and that's why it becomes a thing. <clears throat> which is actually a very Marxist interpretation of, uh, of racial differences. This idea that the upper, class, upper classes will just uh, divide their populations into co uh, eternal conflict based off of race so that they don't go into this uh, class conflict and overthrow the, uh, overthrow the upper class and then establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. This is a classic Marxist concept in American history, at least. So uh, Baldwin and then Podhortz using him, are, are trying to come up with this race-blind idea uh, that is completely foreign to American history, as you can at least see by the immigration laws. Um, very foreign to American history and its peoples. And they're trying to pass it off as the, the real, mature, conservative position. Um, you might be able to personally employ the heuristic I just gave. What would the old right say to these racial conflicts? What would they do? And I can, uh, I can let you all come to that conclusion on your own. 
Uh, Paul, did you have anything on this section before we moved on? I mean, the only thing that like comes to mind is, you know, is is because we've been going for almost two hours and we still got a few more pages of this essay. Um, the only thing that comes to mind is that, you know, the the choice you have here is whether whether you choose to base your political opinions off of delusions or off of just taking reality as it is and trying to work in the margins of that reality. The old right chose the latter. The new right and the new left chose the former. They chose, uh, and that's and that's what makes them truly the inheritors of German idealism, is that they chose to uh, like you know try to implement these abstract concepts into reality rather than taking reality at its face value and attempting to marginally improve it on the edges wherever they could. Right, and I, I would agree. So as he said, we we should continue. <clears throat> he continues. Yet the tragic fact is that love is not the answer to hate. Not in the world of politics, at any rate. Color is indeed a political rather than a human or a personal reality, which I, I don't think anyone here would find to be true, but we'll continue. And if politics, which is to say power, has made it into a human and personal reality, then only politics, which is to say power, can unmake it once again. Uh, and hopefully now everyone in the audience can see why this is an absolutely terrible uh, prior to work with, because they're going to use power in politics to uh, undo reality, I suppose. Uh, but we'll continue. But the way of politics is slow and bitter, and is impatient, and as impatience on the one side is matched by a setting of the jaw on the other, we move closer and closer to an explosion in blood, uh, to an explosion, and blood may get run in the streets. Will this madness in which we are all caught never find a resting place? Is there never to be an end of it? In thinking about the Jews, I have often wondered whether their survival as a distinct group is worth one hair on the head of a single infant. Did the Jews have to survive so that the six million innocent people should one day be burned in the ovens of Auschwitz? It is a terrible question, and no one, not God himself, could ever answer it to my satisfaction. <laughs> that's a that's a pretty big uh, uh, admission there about how uh, Jewish uh, religious philosophy has, ev has evolved in the face of these narratives, but we'll continue. And when I think about the Negroes in America, and about the image of integration as a state in which the Negroes would, uh, would take their rightful place as another of the protected minorities in a pluralistic society, I wonder whether they really believe in their hearts that such a state can actually be attained, and if so, why they should wish to survive as a distinct group. I think I know why the Jews once wished to survive, though I am less certain as to why we still do. They not only believed that God had given them no choice, but they were tied to a memory of a past glory, and a dream of imminent redemption. What does the American Negro have that might correspond to this? His past- I wanted to make the joke of, perhaps the redemption is more imminent than you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll leave that. <laughs> he says, uh, what, what does the American Negro have that might correspond to this? His past is a stigma, his color is a stigma, and his vision of the future is the hope of erasing the stigma by making color irrelevant, by making it disappear as a fact of consciousness. I share this hope, but I cannot see how it will ever be realized unless color does in fact disappear. And that means not integration. It means assimilation. It means, let the brutal word come out, miscegenation. The black Muslims, like their racist counterparts in the white world, accused the so-called Negro leaders of secretly pursuing miscegenation as a goal. The racists are wrong, but I wish that they were right, for I believe that the wholesale merging of the two races is the most desirable alternative for everyone concerned. I am not claiming that this alternative can be pursued programmatically, or that it, can, it, it is immediately feasible as a solution. Obviously, there are even greater barriers to its achievement than to the achievement of integration. What I am saying, however, is that in my opinion, the Negro problem can be solved in this country in no other way. <laughs> I, I don't know that we really need to comment on that. I think the audience can just see that this is where he finds a solution. It's just, just an, like socially engineered miscegenation of the two races to stop dealing with the problem immediately at hand. Um, yeah, so, um, and this is the last paragraph that we're going to be reading today. He says, I have told the story of my own twisted feelings about Negroes here, and of how they, con uh, how they conflict with the moral convictions I have since developed. In order to assert that such feelings must be acknowledged as honestly as possible so that they can be controlled and ultimately disregarded in favor of the convictions, 
it is wrong for a man to suffer because of the color of his skin. Besides that, beside that cliched proposition of liberal thought, what argument can stand and be respected? If the arguments are the arguments of feeling, they must be made to yield, and one's own soul is not the worst place to begin working a huge social transformation. Not long ago, it used to be asked of white liberals, would you like your sister to marry one? When I was a boy and my sister was still unmarried, I would certainly have said no to that question. But now, I am a man. My sister is already married, and I have daughters. If I were to be asked today whether I would like a daughter of mine to marry one, I would have to answer no, I wouldn't like it at all. I would rail and rave and rant and tear my hair. And then I hope I would have the courage to curse myself for raving and ranting, and to give her my blessing. How dare I withhold it at the behest of my child? I once was a... Sorry. How dare I withhold it at the behest of the child I once was, and against the man I now have a duty to be. And with that, two gin-scented tears rolled down Podhoritz's face, and he was happy. <laughs> uh. So, uh, that's how he ends this essay about uh, colorblindness and race blindness. He uh, ends it by acknowledging the fact that the races are extremely different, and the only way you can get rid of it is by uh, blending them. Uh, so... I, I mean, I, I, there is nothing to be said about this that is new. There is nothing you can say <laughs> about this that is new. You know, I, you know, I, I, I don't any sort of expression of of anger or incredulosity or you know, I'm, I'm or whatever else you can't really say to this. Um, these these you cannot convince these people otherwise, and they must be opposed by other means. Yeah. So this is a. Uh... Um, this was written in 19, the 1960s, 1963 in Commentary Magazine. Uh, no, no small place to write something, and uh, certainly not... Uh, this isn't new. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, over 60 years old now. So, uh, we've had generations of this idea being floated around, and uh, this is the conservative circles. Remember, he still calls himself a liberal at the time this essay is written, but neoconservatives looked at this and thought this was a great foundation uh, for their, uh, for at least their race relations philosophy. Uh, this is why you see certain neoconservatives talk about race blindness, color blindness, and then also later talk about just blending the races to get rid of the issue. Well, and you uh, know, this is this is a this is a rhetorical tactic that you know every leftist will always. Use. It's 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 also called lying. Um, some people call it lying. <laughs> Um, but this, this rhetorical tactic that they use is they actually, what they'll do is they'll claim something is already the case that they want to be the case. Um, you know, for example, like, you know, talk to a normie today. I've talked to plenty of normies, like somewhat left-leaning liberals, like, oh, well, everyone's mixing now, you know, no, there's, there's not really going to be any races in 50 years by 2050, everyone's mixing. And, uh, that's not really happening. Um, Yes, you've got more. The, the, it, it, it's only ever happened on the fringes of society. It's just, you know, the comment that was made during the Texas debacle, every state is a border state. Uh, and that's true. Basically, it's not that, what is it? It's not that the world has been made uh, into a, a big melting pot. It's just that, it, it, like, what is it? It's that, um, what is it? Borders will always exist, must always exist. But it's just that geo when geopolitical borders, you know, cease to functionally mean anything, um, everywhere becomes a borderland. Um, and so it, it's, it's not, you know, it's not that the borderlands have ceased existing. It's that the cores have ceased existing. Um, it's that the, it's that the nation itself that was once, you know, within the, the once, you know, far away from the borders has stopped existing. Um, and I mean, and it, it's the same thing, you know, I've, I've been on a kick with, uh, petroleum as an industry. It's the same thing with this idea of, EVs of quote unquote, you know, I, I can't, I can't, I can't even refer to this source of energy generation outside of using their marketing. I, the only way you can refer to it is green energy or renewables. Um, the, like, like, and, and by inherently like identifying it, it's that it, it makes it positive. I can't refer to it in a negative way, uh, without the end user being confused. Um, that might actually be something that we should come up with. We should find a way to refer to that. But basically, yeah, you know, yeah. reality is knocking on the door of of uh, the government of uh, the government and the WEF pushing these, and it's actually turning out that we're actually going to need a lot more oil and petroleum to keep things running than uh, than we thought. Right. Um, 
Exactly, and I, I don't mean to uh, uh, walk away uh, walk away from the point that you just made. I just wanted to also bring up something else about Pod Horowitz's family. He mentioned that he had daughters at the end there, and while the hypothetical said uh, if if the daughter wanted to, would he allow it? And he said eventually yes. Um, how how did reality actually turn out? Uh, well, his daughter is uh, Ruthie Blum, and this is just quoting from her Wikipedia page. I don't think this is a controversial place to use Wikipedia. Uh, I'm just going to quote directly. She was, uh, she was previously married to former Israel Broadcasting Authority News Editor-in-Chief Steve Leibowitz, during which time she lived in Har Adar, a suburb of Jerusalem. Blum had four children. So that's, uh, that's how that turned out for the Bob Horitz family, for his daughter. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's just how the story is going to end, I think. Unless, Paul, you had any other thing to say. No, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's... it's... What is it? It's um. What is it? It's a. It's it's a community for me and not for the. Right. Yeah. And even even in the thing, uh, he's saying that he eventually doesn't want his community, but clearly that has not uh, been demonstrated by their revealed preferences. Yeah. So, um, with that, uh, I think we're we're going to hop over to the super chats, and these are going to be especially necessary today because I'm not going to turn the monetization on on this video, at least to uh, in hopes that it doesn't draw the eye to this, um. So we have uh, Yeehaw Yenzer for $5. Thank you very much, sir. He says good morning. I think that he popped in early because he couldn't uh, stay for the rest of the stream, if I remember correctly. So thank you very much. The $5 is dearly appreciated. Um, and for those who uh, don't know, Yeehaw Yenzer, I believe, is uh, uh, I believe that's the name that he goes under for our recent OGC article uh, by him and some of the other ones. So uh, go check him out over at the Old Glory Club. The, uh, the link to the Old Glory, Club Wex uh, Old Glory Club website is in the description. Um, he was actually touching on topics of discrimination as it related to insurance recently. So, uh, go check him out. Thank you very much for the $5, sir. We have Saddam Hussein, the ND, fatigable for nine ninety nine. Thank you very much, sir. He says, uh, Patai's The Jewish Mind has a chapter titled Jewish Self-Hate with subsections on parasitism, collective guilt slash collective excellence, uh, also collective history of alcoholism, drug abuse, and obesity. Um, yeah, we certainly, I think, saw the uh, uh, psychological category of Jewish self-hate there at the last uh, last paragraph of this, and I think he was acknowledging it as well. I think he used the words uh, like self-loathing or something like that in the essay. I, I'd have to go back and read it. I know we just read it, but there was something one definitely... To, one has to wonder why they have such a deeply inculcated sense of self-hatred. <laughs> right. So, uh, thank you very much, Saddam Hussein. Uh uh, our, one of our greatest supporters here on the right, uh, the great one and only Saddam Hussein, the indefatigable. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, that would be a good resource for the audience audience to go check out if you are uh, in any way mystified by the writings of Pod Horitz here. Um, Portler for nine ninety nine. Thank you very much, sir. He is giving us the Rod Dreyer line, primitive root wieners. Um, yeah, that's basically what this amounted to. I'm sure, given the uh, 1960s uh, vestiges of, uh, of uh, merited prudishness in their media, I'm sure this is probably how that was taken at the time. Um, very, very strange essay. Um, then we have El Thimplar for uh, $10. Thank you very much, sir. Um, he says, The liberal and conservative's obsession of black people stems from needing to fulfill their egalitarian idol. They fear looking behind them and seeing how much they burned sustaining this force. I don't think they do fear looking behind them. Uh, I think the older ones do, certainly. But uh, now I think it's, a, it's a, gleeful, uh, a gleeful disregard for what they have to destroy in order to get that idol. Um, but yeah, it is certainly an idol of egalitarianism. Uh, it is a religious uh, tenant in and of itself. And that isn't me being hyperbolic. You can go check your conservative and liberal churches and see if they think that equality of the races is a religiously mandated doctrine. Uh, you, you might be surprised as to the answer if you think this is just a political consideration. So, uh, with that, thank you very much, everyone, for the very generous monetary support. Um, I, I like I said, uh, if if I don't private this video, and I don't think I'm going to do that, I think we're just going to leave this one unmonetized, and uh, hopefully the eye of Sauron does not uh, does not punish us for talking about uh, Pod Horitz's uh, Negro problem and apparently our problem, which is a uh, I, I don't know. I think maybe he's uh, he should be speaking for himself there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Paul Fahrenheit, uh, any any last comments on the material before we start shilling? No. 
<laughs> okay, all right, yeah, that's probably for the best. Uh, so, uh, with that being said, Paul, you're fine. My friend's link is in the description. The Old Glory Club link is in the description. Nonetheless, g tell the audience about yourself. What do you do? What do you study? Where do you write? Uh, why might they be interested? G give us the pitch. Well, I mean, I, I occasionally write uh, articles on my Substack, the Fahrenheit Family Archives. I occasionally write for the Old Glory Club. Um, if you have any interest in, like, a sort of American mythos fantasy project uh, a country squire's notebook you can find on my gum road um it's a it's a digital copy but that's my collection of short stories set in a sort of mythologized fantasized version of virginia um i mean other than that like and support the old glory club follow the old glory club do what the old glory club does uh etc all that um that's all i really got Oh yeah, and uh, and I'll post the link to that Gumroad here in the uh, here in the chat. Uh, I would encourage everyone to go and support our good friend Paul Fahrenheit here because he has come up with some very quality um, fiction uh, that actually is trying to build an American mythos. You see this about like the uh, the Arthurian legends in England, how they are happening in real places, though they may or may not be fan uh, fantasy. You see it about the various different uh, tales that come out of France and Spain. Germans have their own. America is kind of lacking. We've kind of been very sort of uh, uh, ultra realistic in our fiction or ultra fanta fantastical. Um, Mr. Paul Fahrenheit here, I think, is kind of rectifying rectifying that. He's giving a little bit of uh, mystery and uh, otherworldliness to these great places here in the country. I, yeah. I, I, what do you think of that? I, I, I mean, I really appreciate that. That is very high praise, and that's kind of what I'm doing. I mean, it's kind of been put to a halt because, you know, certain matters of um, you know, attempting, attempting to get money have, uh, prevented that, uh, prevented the continuation of it thus far. Um, also, unfortunately, dear readers, um, it is absolutely vital for the continuance of the American mythos, uh, that I, uh, that I acquire a bright red Indian scout 60 with a brown seat and two brown leather saddlebags. This is unfortunately <laughs> extremely vital. Um, it can, you know, the, the American mythos simply cannot be written without it. Um, and I, I assure you, I assure you that once such is, uh, is acquired, then, uh, the American mythos can in fact continue. Fantastic. So, um, I, I would encourage everyone to go, uh, go support, uh, Mr. Fahrenheit's work there just because that is, a this is a project that I am also interested in. I'm, uh, I haven't actually done anything on the topic, but, you know, reading, uh, Minkin's The American Language, going through all of my different tomes that I've acquired over the years on American folklore and all this other stuff. Um, certainly, the last century and a half or so has uh, has sort of lacked in giving a uh, giving a mystical and otherworldly feel to the uh, feel to the countryside and the places in which we inhabit. So, um, go, go support him. It's a project that I personally like, and it's a project that we need to have happen, especially if we're to leave a cultural imprint upon upon the generations that are to come after us. So, yeah. With that, uh, go check out the Old Glory Club. Go check out Mr. Fahrenheit's. Uh, uh, family archives on his Substack, and uh, go check out my backlog as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in to the neoconservative uh, series, uh, we started I think a month ago now. Uh, no, a little bit less than a month ago, uh, where we were talking about the different uh, uh, the different economics views of the neoconservatives. So uh, next week, I'm sure we will pick the series back up somewhere. Uh, the Moynihan report is certainly very tempting to cover. Um, so we'll see, but we will be back again uh, next Saturday, or oh, maybe not next Saturday morning. I might be gone next Saturday morning. It might be two weeks from now, actually. Uh, yes, I will be gone next Saturday, so not then, but we will be back on the uh, 17th, I hope, of February, where we will be picking back up this neoconservative series. Thank you very much for joining, Mr. Paul Fahrenheit. This was, uh, this was very enjoyable. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm always happy to come back on. Fantastic. So... Uh, with that, go catch his work, check out the backlog here. I'll see you all in two weeks. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.